Hello, good morning everybody. Welcome to the 2023 Ready from wherever you are watching across the world. We are coming to you live from Abuja and I'm Chamberlain Usof. Here from Abuja as well. Well, no, Chamberlain and I do not call a coordinate. Good morning and welcome. <laughs> Matter, it's good to be coordinated, though. It's the day after Valentine's. I hope you had a swell day. Welcome to the program. I'm Maupe Ugu Yusuf. Well, it seems we color coordinated here. <laughs> <laughs> How we achieved it, I don't know. Good morning and welcome. It's the 2023 verdict. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. And Maupe, every time you remind me, it's... Uh... Val Val Valentine's Day, I remember that two days after is my daughter's birthday, and that's a bill for me. Anyway, good morning and welcome. I'm Ayo Makinde. Today is the 15th day, yes, of February, closer and closer to the day. Well, 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 yes, indeed, Ayo, and you know, we'd like to hear from you all. Let us even know what going through your mind. I know that, look. We see all kinds of images, several reports about what is playing out in the policy. Do the authorities even have an idea of what you are going through as a result of some of the policies that are being implemented out there? Yes, you can get your voices heard. Make, take advantage of all of these handles that we provide for you. And we will get your voices out there as much as we can. So uh, it could be the hashtag 2023 verdict. It could be the 2023 verdict at channel It could be the even regular social media handles that we rely on. Good old handles, aren't they? We won't let them go for you. <laughs> so uh, we'll look forward to all of that. But then, while you do that, or you wait until you go, we go through the dailies or have our conversations on, the countdown, the clock is ticking. Always been ticking. Huh? How many now? Look at that. Ten hours. Just ten, ten days, days, I beg your pardon. Ten days. Ten days. Mm -hmm. Just ten. I mean, I can imagine when it will be just one. <laughs> and then maybe, who knows, it could just be 56 minutes sometime. And then it could be 30. You know, it, it's, it's interesting, actually. But how all of these things are playing out, wow. And you know what they say about time. Time really does fly. Indeed it does. Well, you let us know. How are you preparing for the polls? Apart from, you know, I want to believe that people have their voters card already. Uh, do you know where your polling unit is, for instance? Um, are you nervous? Do you have any anxiety about the period of the polls? Share it with us and let us see how it is that we can help. Um, it'll be interesting to, to note, uh, you know, just what it is that people have on their minds, oh. even as the elections approach. And do you feel safe too? Maybe we should add that as well. What do you think moving up to go out there and vote? Uh, are you able to get, we saw some old coins. <laughs> old coins. Old coins. Yeah. They are new coins, Chamberlain. They are they new coins? They are new coins. They are old in our minds because <laughs> <laughs> when <laughs> has anybody even used any of those? They are brand new coins. Coins that have always been a part of our currency but which we rarely ever see or rarely ever use. Oh boy. And you know what? The Supreme Court will resume sitting today in this Naira swap matter that's been making the rounds. Remember, three states had gone to the courts and then several others have been, the attorneys general in different states were uh, directed to join that suit by their councils, the governors, the principals. So, seven-month panel of the APS court last week, Wednesday, did grant that interim injunction as requested by those suing states. Remember them? Kogi, Kaduna, and Zamfara, they were restraining the federal government through the CBN or the commercial banks from suspending or determining or ending on February 10, the time frame with which the now old version of the 200, 500, and the 1,000 Naira denominations of the Naira may no longer be legal tender pending the hearing and determination of their motion on notice for interlocutory injunction. Who knows what happens today? Uh, we do know that a number of states have you know, indicated interest to join. One person who did that very loudly on, while on the campaign rally was the governor of River State. Uh, Ian Sambike, who says he, uh, you know, his state will also be party to that suit. So I guess we'll be seeing more and more of the state governors, uh, you know, 
at least those who have indicated interest to join the matter today and let us yeah. know how many there are against the federal government. So that will be interesting and um, the campaign train is on, guys. Oh yes, the campaign train of uh, the APC takes the whole team on that campaign to River State today. It's interesting, I mean, given the conversation we had with the PDP chieftain, you know, yesterday, talking about the fact that <laughs> <laughs> the River State government was going to deliver, you know, um, PDP to you know, the PDP, to the PDP <laughs> whatever. Even though, of course, I think it was a rally of uh, sorts in, in River State yesterday. How far <laughs> that if affected or is it going to impact the elections for the PDP presidential campaign, I guess we'll wait to see. But it's the APC that is going to uh, River State, as you can see right there uh, uh, on your screen. And I mean, all of the, there's been some drama in the build up to APC going to River State. <laughs> I don't even want to go there. <laughs> I don't even want to go there. You know, yesterday I was talking about paradoxes, and uh, <laughs> the conversation in Abuja was quite interesting yesterday. And uh, you know, I, I pretty much like how Chimbley engaged the PDP spokesman, who kept on saying that you know there's been attacks recorded on PDP supporters in uh, River State, and which is a state, PDP, a PDP state, a PDP state. <laughs> and we're wondering how in the world could that happen, you know? But um, if the APC has smooth sail with its campaign in Rivers uh, today, River State, and the PDP did not, well, is that the current pattern of politicking? Well, it's not that PDP isn't, because the PDP has held quite a few uh, rallies, if one can say, the led PDP by the uh, governor. Governor, yeah. But the presidential, presidential campaign, campaign, that's, yeah, what that's we another have kettle of fish However, entirely. I guess from what we heard yesterday, as far as the PDP uh, presidential campaign council is concerned, Governor Wiki will deliver the PDP, PDP. presidential, uh, well, the PDP president. For River State. For River State. I guess we'll wait to see. So we'll wait to see. We're, we're going to be shocked. You know, the politicians always say, you will be shocked. Please, I hope there is enough, <laughs> enough shock absorber for Nigerians. <laughs> well, talking about campaigns, the PDP will be holding its campaign rally in Jigawa State today. So we uh, look forward to, you know, uh, many more campaign rhetorics, many more promises about how the PDP is going to make every wrong right uh, should its presidential candidate uh, emerge victorious uh, come Saturday or days after Saturday when we'll be looking forward to hearing election results. All I want is what Mark Ware and Chamberlain talked about, that the voter be educated and be aware, well aware of their rights and responsibilities rights and responsibilities. People are going to go uh, um, to, you know, the location of that rally for the PDP in Jigawa State. Thankfully, we haven't heard so much, uh, you know, violence or, or insecurity at campaign rallies, unlike previous times. I, I think that's a little cheering for me, but... Well, apart from what was recorded in Lagos apart from that, last which is, Saturday. was recorded in Lagos, and even previously, mm -hmm. you know, involving which, of course, two, the two major parties in Nigeria have been, you know, having some kind of spat about that. But for the people, let us be, let us make ourselves well aware of our rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. from the guidelines for the elections mm -hmm. that INEC has put out. But, well, besides, uh, you know, uh, you know, the absence of violence, which is cheery to note. Uh, we look forward to campaigns where there will be some form of engagement, you know, besides the cheering and the rejoicing and the, uh, you know, uh, the musicians performing, where voters can engage with their uh, preferred candidates mm. and ask critical questions. It looks like, um, uh, you know, El Dorado mm. for now, but we hope to mature to that point yeah. where there'll be debates, you I like, know, I like the at, way you, uh, at campaigns. I like the way you ended it. <laughs> Your skepticism No, 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 it's not skepticism. Ayo. It's just that, I mean, how will that happen at a campaign rally? Don't answer that question. Jimberly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. All right. We hear you all. So, um, 
Let's go right ahead and take you through some of the dailies and see how they are reflecting developments today. Take a look at Vanguard newspaper. No need extending deadline for old notes. CBN. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Well, you didn't even know what I'm thinking in the first place. So just go ahead and uh, tell us what you're thinking. We'd we'll like to hear from you and make it interesting, if you will. Uh, look at the writers now. Vows to arrest POS operators charging exorbitantly. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, I think the CBN governor finally spoke yesterday. Uh, which is what a lot of people have been waiting for him to do. And I think perhaps it was pressed home by the fact that he was addressing the diplomatic core. Uh, you know, that even diplomats in our country were uncertain of what, you know, implications the policy held for them, whether there was an extension or not. Uh, and they, I think uh, the Foreign Ministry of Foreign Affairs had to invite the CBN governor to engage with the diplomatic core. Now, if the diplomatic core as you know at, at that level as they are did not have a clear direction how much more the nigerian people so we had to glean something from what he said yesterday mm -hmm. uh, and take it as the policy direction for the cbn but at least there is some clarity now that the cbn is standing by its february 10 deadline and that's what it is we'll explore that a little further here on the program so when they say they vow to arrest pos operators i know many were asked that Okay, but um, what about all this back and forth between the banks and the CBN when CBN says, well, we've given them money, and the banks say, we don't have this money. And then people say, well, publish, how much have you given to the banks, how much have you printed? So has anybody been reprimanded, arrested, cautioned mm -hmm. in any banks whatsoever for flouting the law, if they are actually flouting the law? And if that's not the case, what does that mean? They're well, only, they're only looking at POS <laughs> operators that are, you know, that are exchanging cash. Jimmy, I had okay. an experience yesterday oh. whereby you go to a filling station. Now mm -hmm. you have to pay before service. Ooh. So you estimate just how much petrol your car can consume. You go and pay at a POS. Before you just imagine that you put your POS, yeah. it's what you consume that you pay for. No, there is a special POS now where you go and put your card. You know, you, you pay a little more. So if you're buying petrol, what, 10,000 naira? You pay mm -hmm. ten thousand two hundred naira. Oh my goodness! Yes, and before you now take the the like a slip. I mean the receipts from the POS then machine. You the then you go to the filling to the filling point <sighs> and then give it to the attendant. Well, that is arrested? what is in operation. I don't know because I, you didn't even get any cash. You, what you did was what the what the CBN was hoping will do. But there is now an extra charge. That is minus the charge your bank will give you, charge you on a, on a good day. There's an extra charge to it now, and it's almost normal. I don't know if the CBN understands what's going on. Wow. But look at the other writers. Now, banks, business owners reject old notes. CSOs hail immediately for standing firms, say only vote buyers complaining. Reject old notes, face sanctions. Ganduji, Abiodun, threaten banks others. FG to take position after Supreme Court ruling. I would have taken that position already. So, <laughs> would they stay back up with CBN? I think we'll, we'll ask the experts here on the program. Uh, there are more scenarios here. Nairo Swap, cash crunch takes toll on small businesses as old banknotes still circulate. So that question, the legal tender status comes back into the burner here today. So um, uh, Buari calls for suspension of blanket visa ban. Will that happen? Should it happen? Should it stay? Hey, you have our handle, so write to, to us. That's the UAE, right? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And then to, uh, yeah, to the UAE. And then, remember, there are several states, several, I think it's the big five who say, we're watching election riggers or those who want to manipulate elections. We will ban them too. That's fine, good. Well, Daily Trust has this for you. Ten days to go. No cash yet for elections. That's according to INEC. Old notes, no longer legal tender. It's uh, from the CBN Governor Emi Fili. Supreme Court hears suit on deadline today. No decision on old notes that's attributed to the presidency. Uh, you might want to flip to page four and or pages four and twenty to know who in the presidency is speaking because if the CBN governor says old notes no longer legal tender. 
and you see no decision on old notes, uh, <laughs> you, you really have to be clear on who has uh, authority over who, you know, what exactly is our legal tender now. And the CBN says old notes no longer legal tender. Police take over CBN in Ondo as irate customers lay siege. <laughs> It's not a laughing matter. It's not a laughing. When people can't get a hold of their money, it, you know, it is not a laughing matter. I think Isn't it better than giving yourself some blood pressure? You know what they say? Laughter is medicine to the bones. <laughs> Try it. It works. There it is. It's infectious. At least I'm laughing now. It works. Uh, take a look at this. Matawale expels NGOs from Zamfara. Sachs commissioner. Okay, you might want to read that story on page five. Which NGOs have been expelled from Zampara? What is the reason given for that? <laughs> you might want to see page 25. Borno, Kaduna, Oyo, Imo, Rivers, Benue, prone to election violence. According to whose report? The details are on page 25 of the paper. Policy somersault responsible for Nigeria's inability to own satellite. That's attributed to former president Obasanjo, page 22 is where you see details. Now this one made me chuckle. Ten days to go. <laughs> I'm going to read the first story. It says, I'm stepping stone to Igbo presidency. And uh, that's attributed to Atiku. Yes, he was in Enugu State yesterday campaigning. Uh, and that's what he, he said to them, I'm stepping stone. But you know, people would say, but you know, the Igbos now have a candidate. But even though he's not, of the, he's not exactly an Igbo project, and his name is Peter, and they call him Okute, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which see. means stone or rock, as the case might oh. be. Will they want... Oh, so he's Would they also, want a stepping stone and so, they want a, a stone? Which so he's also an apology of a stone? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's an apology of a Peter, I quote don't, and unquote. Je ne sais pas. I don't know. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tinubu, I'll build on Buhari's legacies. Uh, mm. uh, and under my watch, out of school syndrome will be reduced in Borno. That is attributed to Jajeri. I guess that is uh, uh, some government, some state government elections you're talking about there. Buhari's legacy. Let's leave it, yes, Buhari's Kashwap. legacy. Is, uh, is still part of it. We hope that one of them <laughs> pick and, and This is a legacy. And fuel scarcity. Let's leave it there for Daily Trust newspapers. And flip to this Nigeria. Well, chuckling here on this side of the divide as well. <laughs> you soon find out why. But let's look at... Uh, this Nigeria, first of all, it has a potpourri of stories for you. It leads also with the Naira crisis, and this is the way it is captioned. Emifiele under fire for insisting on February 10 old notes deadline. It's wrong to flout Supreme Court order, says Falano, of course capturing his appearance on the verdict 2023 yesterday apex court to hear suit against cbn today and not forgetting the high court judgment also stopping the federal government from extending suspending or stopping the naira redesign policy how that is situated within the context of the supreme court's hearing today on the same matter well we really don't know uh, but uh, the cbn governor's position does it capture the reality of what's happening today is the situation better now can you uh you know are you still finding those queues at atms and are the banks still milling over with customers trying to get cash well you have the answers today but you don't have to go to the gym anymore you know to exercise and get those muscles oh, really? just get two bags of coins you know, from the banks. I'm trying to convince Ayo, you know, to subscribe to that instead of paying heavily at his gym. But <laughs> it's been a hard sell. I'll pass. <laughs> but you know, I, it's very interesting that, um, as Mark Pepp pointed out, you know, the governor of CBN, of the CBN, was speaking with diplomats yesterday and uh, to make all those comments that he was making. I find it very, very interesting that uh, that comment was coming from the CBN governor that week. I am going to disobey the highest court in the land. Of the land. And he's saying that to diplomats. It's very interesting. Well, uh, there's this also on the Naira uh, redesign policy just beside the nameplate. Naira scarcity. Nigeria's GDP may lose $18 million monthly, Rwani warns. 
uh, well, so many other uh, implications of the Nari design policy. But uh, let's move to politics now, as uh, reported by this Nigeria. Tinubu promises to unify Nigeria as Atiku reassures Indigo on power shift. Both parties campaigned in the southeast yesterday. And uh, finally, before we exit this Nigeria, this, this one at the bottom strip, G5 not dead will act on February 25, says Wiki, and that's the Rivers State Governor, as court stretches order stopping PDP from suspending uh, Rivers Governor. Uh, should, would it be safe to say that uh, the other four governors in the G5 group will also be going the way of Governor Wiki's secret presidential candidate on February the 25th. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for their press secretaries to speak. To speak. Because I'm not one of them. Oh, you wait for the results of uh, the elections Well, the governor, after February the 25th. Well, Governor Wiki has made his own position or their position known Clear. overtly or covertly. I'm just going to have to wait, wait. for their press release. <laughs> okay. We're going to get into that. <clears throat> Let's leave it there for this Nigeria. The Guardian newspaper also is very interested, very much interested in what's happening with the banks and has a connection with the Supreme Court. Banks risk run on as citizens await Supreme Court intervention. It would seem that that had already started in some parts of the country. CBN insists no extension on February 10 deadline for old notes. I hope the CBN is aware. That's, that's like saying, look, we know what the CBN has said, they sent, the Supreme Court has said, but we are not going to obey. Even though, as Mr. Falano said yesterday, when, once the issue is out, it takes immediate effect. On what ground the CBN governor or CBN is standing, I guess we'll wait to see. Other writers, Nigeria may lose $18 million in GDP monthly to Naira squeeze, that's ascribed to Rewane. Old notes rejection spreads across Nigeria. CBN needs to pump more than it mopped to avert major financial crisis, described to Adonri. Uh, Ex-CIBN -C president. CIBN, CBN, other stakeholders must collaborate to restore confidence. Ogun files application to join Kaduna Zamfara Kogi suit against FG. Getting thicker, wouldn't you say? You know, that's uh, the lead of the paper and a number of other stories you'll find on the front page, but that's the Guardian newspaper this morning. Yeah, take a look at News Direct. Uh, anxiety, as CBN says, no going back on Nairo swap and the Nairo swap deadline. I think similar to what uh, Ayo was talking about, where he says that um, the CBN was just statements or directly saying to the um, diplomatic community, I will disobey the highest court of the land. Oh dear. So you can imagine diplomats themselves will be sitting there looking at each other saying, if they are going to disobey their own court, you can imagine what's going to happen to any business concerns that we want to bring to this country. Mm. It means that they will have no regard whatsoever for rules and laws, what do we make of that, gentlemen? They might tell themselves. Hmm. Now that is that is something to consider. But maybe that's not how maybe that's not how they meant it. Maybe, you know, the CBN is convinced that the Supreme Court's decision really isn't binding on it. I, I do not imagine a situation <laughs> where yeah, because really? you know, as you say, a thousand lawyers, a thousand opinions. Uh, maybe they're convinced that it's not really binding because I cannot imagine that the Supreme Court or a court, any court at all, will directly give the CBN a, an order yeah. and it will go right ahead and flout it. Well, yesterday we yes. had Mr. Femi, Femi file on the SEN who yeah. reminded us all because things move so quick and fast in this country, you could forget, where he says, there's been several rulings, at least two that he, he told us, yes. where CBN was not direct party and they benefited from that judgment. They latched onto it, you know, like a dog to water, and they executed it. So how do you then pick and choose, say, well, I was not joined. Oh, but then the other one you were not joined, you, you, you chose it? Well, you chose it. So I think that they, that need to, they need to clarify to us precisely, are they willfully disobeying the Supreme Court of the land? And, and besides, They need to really, because the implications are grave. Yeah, I mean, don't they say, 
ignorance of the law mm. is not an excuse. Mm. Haven't you flattered by, okay, uh, assuming you, you broke, the, you ran the lights by mistake. Do the VIA or another tell you, I'm sorry, I didn't know. What did they tell you? You know the answer. That's News Direct this morning. Well, New Telegraph also has this. Naira policy shifting February 10 deadline. Not necessary. Attributed to Emi Feely. Says 700 billion Naira optimum cash, optimum cash level meant to be in circulation. Is it in circulation? That's the really key question. It says it's meant to be in circulation. Once POS agents charging above 200 Naira risk arrest, jail term, Ganduje Abiodun threatened to sanction banks rejecting old notes. Okay, so the banks are going to be in trouble now because they have a regulator to obey uh, who has said f shifting February deadline, uh, February 10 deadline, not necessary. So who do they listen to? The governors or their regulator? Or going to join governor's suit against federal government currency swap policy. Political. That's according to Wiki. Apex Bank flouting Supreme Court's ruling. That's according to Falano. CSO's alleged hidden plot by governors to cause mayhem. And at the bottom, their presidency. We'll, we need leader that will unite, secure Nigeria. That's according to Baba Med. And look at this. This happened yesterday. Uh, thank God one paper at least is reporting it. MTN's network crash yeah puts over 80 million subscribers offline mm -hmm. oh yes people couldn't make phone calls yesterday couldn't browse for couldn't hours. do for hours <laughs> they were <laughs> what Any happened compensation? there was a crash and there's been no word there's been no apology there's been no nothing this is supposed to be something we're all supposed to be moving to you know these are the kinds of things that are supposed to enable cashless policy so imagine that this kind of thing just crashes oh, oh everybody what will happen what will happen to transactions, for instance? Well, let's leave it there for New Telegraph. Well, that leads us to asking you the question. Do you think the authorities actually know what they're doing? Do you think this all deliberate, all this, the policies, everything going on? Write us an email. We'd we'll like to hear from you because, I mean, you are the one at least experiencing whatever you're experiencing, wherever you are. But that ends a look at some of the dailies here this morning anyways. We will be back in just a moment. Of course, we'll talk about all of this, how does it affect you? What is the position of the law? Are they right? Who's wrong? What should be done? Join us in a moment. the first time that members of the diplomatic corps will be having an official briefing on the redesigning of the three highest denominations of the Naira. The issue has generated a lot of controversies recently and the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs explains that the federal government is not oblivious to these challenges, adding that the government is seeking ways to resolve it. We believe that it is our responsibility as a nation to make it easier for you to function in Nigeria and therefore after the central bank governor would have apprised you of uh, what the policy is all about we would want to give you an opportunity to also interact with the CBN governor to ask questions that are pertinent to this policy the central bank governor has been in the eye of the storm, especially after the Supreme Court ordered that the Apex Bank should suspend the February 10 deadline, pending the determination of a suit filed by some state governors. The CBN is working hard to shift pressure, to shift resources to those areas in order to ease the tension. The situation is substantially coming down since the commencement of the over-the-counter payment to, com to complement ATM disbursements and, and the use of super agents. There is therefore no need to consider any shift from the deadline of February the 10th. The idea behind the policy is the concern for the economy, insecurity and election spending. We have told the FCC, the ICPC, working with our CBM monitoring, monitoring team to arrest 
any POS agent that charges any fee, because we had made it clear that whatever is their fee, which is not which is not meant to be more than two hundred naira for any amount you exchange, that we central bank we will pay as part of the cost to make to lessen the burden of this problem. The meeting then goes into a closed door session. The Apex Bank is optimistic that the Naira redesigned policy is beneficial to the nation's economy and calls for the support of all Nigerians to make it a success. Yeah, welcome back to the 2023 verdict. Yes, it's Mr. Harris of Goli that's here. You did recognize yourself almost, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> well, that's how many people don't recognize what's going on in this country. That's it, ask it. Is this still the same country? I'm seeing bags of coins. I have to go to the gym with bags of coins these days. When you days. go to the bank now, they give you uh, five naira notes in tons. And then. And you wonder, wow, is it that valuable these days now? But we know how well, this whole thing uh, plays out. We're told that th this probably could reflect the value of the naira at some point in time. So. It, is this, I mean, is, has that been your experience? Have, have no, you no, been no, given no. five naira notes? Oh, yes, yes, I have been given five, five naira notes. They come brand new, all right, yeah, but in bundles. And to take uh, like 100,000 naira was quite a whole lot, you know, and it was, wow. it was really crazy. Yeah. But, but as a senior lawyer, when you face that and you know what the law says and what the authorities are saying, what goes through your mind? Well, I, I see there's a disconnect, there's, there's some form of confusion because. Um, the process is not is, is not following you know duly to uh, an end that you will say that um, service is properly delivered. I give you an instance. The law is very clear on the issue of you know currency redesign, you know management of currency, and the powers of the Central Bank of Nigeria under the directive of the president. But the implementation of it now, particularly the time frame and the season in which we are, is such that it's causing a lot of confusion. And then one other side of it is that one moment you hear, you know, from one arm of government telling you uh, they, they will obey the order of court, at least the attorney general tells you that they will obey the order of court, and we're happy about that. Then the CBN says, all right, um, one minute they're also saying they will obey, and then, uh, which invariably means they will extend the time as uh, um, uh, by virtue of the order of the Supreme Court. And then only yesterday or so, we're reading again and listening that, and that, that uh, they're saying that, look, the, the date stands. So which would be clearly an affront on the order of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, which is unfortunate. So it leaves everybody in confusion. You know, for, for instance, I mean, when you say clearly an affront, um, because I think uh, part of the narrative is Mark Bear was trying to make, make it also this morning, because could it be? that there are actually people in the CBN, or lawyers in the CBN, who are telling the CBN governor, you're in declare. If you're not a party to the suit, you can't say you're in breach of any law. Can that be possible? I, I'd rather say no, with due respect. Uh, because the duty of obedience of court order is on all and sundry. That's one. And then secondly, when there's an order of court and you are dissatisfied with the order of court. Under the concept of rule of law, the option open to you is to approach that court or appeal against the judgment of court. In this case, what we have at hand is a case where there is uh, an ex parte order of court, which, you know, in no time would uh, flux. However, if you are dissatisfied with the order of the Supreme Court, in this case, the Supreme Court of Nigeria, the appropriate thing to do is to approach the court, either seek to join as a party, and then make your case, rather than sit back and say, look, you would not obey the order of court. That is contempt mm. ex facie courier. Well, and it's unfortunate. I but that's other, clearly against the grain of rule of law. I have further questions, but we have another guest um, online, and he's joining us via Zoom uh, from a lawyer, Mr. Ken D. Eleja, who's also a legal practitioner and founder, head of practice, Kiki Eleja and Company. Uh, you, good morning, sir, and welcome to the program. Good morning. It's my pleasure, it's my pleasure to be part of the program this morning. 
morning. Well, I'm sure that you've had quite your, uh, I mean, a, a fair share of your own experience in Ilori, the, the state capital of Kwara State. And I'm wondering, uh, from what it is that you have experienced and what it is that you have seen going on and the pronouncement of the CBN governor yesterday while meeting with the diplomatic corps here in Nigeria, uh, I'm wondering, do you think that the CBN is in contravention of the order of the Supreme Court asking all parties to stay action pending its ruling or its convenience today? Thank you very much. Well, I think a convenient starting point would be for me to say that uh, the experience here in the lorry has been quite very challenging. You know Nigerians, the way we operate, the US operators have been capitalizing on the situation, and some of them can what else? 20%. 20%. To, to disperse money to customers. It's been very, very hectic. And the fear I have is that we may get to a situation whereby many small businesses will be paralyzed. Because you have a situation whereby we have sellers of perishables, especially who are willing to sell their wares, you have willing buyers. But the problem now is, because people have presumably acting on the directive of the CBN, they are rejecting these uh, so-called loan notes, contrary to the order of the Supreme Court. And so I, I think uh, we are we may be heading for anarchy, unless something is done urgently. Because bear in mind that most Nigerians do not uh, they operate uh, the electronic platform, especially in the rural areas. So after that, I want to say that uh, the situation we have on hand now, concerning the Supreme of the Central Bank of Nigeria, for the valid order made by the Supreme Court is most unfortunate. It is unfortunate because the Central Bank of Nigeria itself is a creation of constitution. The appointment of the governor of the Central Bank is something that is regulated by law. Now we have a situation where an order has been made, like my learned brother has said, the duty which is incumbent upon everyone, no matter how high, who is aware of an order that affects his interest, is to take legal steps to challenge such an order. It is beyond any individual, no matter how highly placed, to take the laws into his own hands and take it as if it does not exist. That does not demonstrate civility. It uh, smacks of arrogance. It smacks of irresponsibility. Because it is very clear, it is a well-known fact that the, 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 the order was necessitated by the conduct of the CBN, which in the first place failed to do the natural. Otherwise, if the CBN had done the natural, we would not be where we are today. So it is really very unfortunate, and I do not see any justification for the conduct of the CBN governor. Don't forget that under the Constitution, the Attorney General of the Federation is a, somebody who is a clot with the power and authority to represent the federal government. And I dare say it's agencies in courts, especially the Supreme Court. And what we have here is not different. The Attorney General of the Federation has been uh, sued. An interim order has been made. Of course, it, uh, it's incumbent upon the CBN to respect such an order. The only condition why it's not going to All be, right. uh, the, the only option open is for the CBN through the Attorney General to go to the Supreme Court to challenge the order. Otherwise, the whole, law, the whole essence of rule of law will be debased and they will be heading for a serious crisis. And it's unfortunate that, that right. this so, is made uh, now. Hello? Yeah, Mr. Ledger, just pardon me. Let me bring it back to me, uh, the SAN here. You know, several. This has several implications. I mean, we're initially talking about the diplomatic community, how they will be, what they'll be thinking, listening to the CBN governor telling them that, well, they are insisting on the February 10 deadline, where the point of the law, as you say, and Mr. Ledger also uh, underscores, is that this is in breach of the law. So they will be thinking, are they violating? Is he telling us he's, 
blatantly violating his own their own Supreme Court's laws. And then you have, <coughs> excuse me, law students. Everybody's watching and saying, wait a minute, what's going on? Is this the, the way the country is going to run? And then the legal community also looking at, because who knows? The next government could look at this scenario and feel, all right. So if they violate the rule, the law of the Supreme God, nothing happened, okay. Means I could do it again, and, and who knows. So it has huge implications that we may not even know how this will pan out eventually. And what do you think? How should the legal community approach all of this? It's because it's got huge implications for them and the entire country. Well, well um, first I'd like to say that we all have a duty uh, to be law-abiding. We all have a duty to be, um, to, to, um, to comply with orders of court. And where orders of courts uh, meet, uh, it behoves upon of us, all of us to ensure that uh, adherence to it is maintained entirely. Now, under a situation where you find um, orders being flouted, particularly the orders of the Supreme Court, however meet, are being flouted. It negates the principle of rule of law, and it creates anarchy, which will loom at large. Clearly, it is a, it's, it's a bad signpost, it's a bad signal for law students, for um, any concerned citizen, to see that the laws of this land, which the Supreme Court is, uh, you know, the chief interpreter of the law, because the judiciary interprets the law and the Supreme Court um, sits apex in terms of interpretation of the law. The laws can be flouted flagrantly without you know, anything happening, no consequence whatsoever. It's unfortunate. And it gives a very wrong impression of the kind of country we are, we are to the international community. Because we're talking about sovereignty, rule of law, and respect in the committee of states. When you're dealing with a country that the CBN, no less a person than the CBN, tells you in the face of uh, an order of the Supreme Court that we will stick to our gun, and you know it doesn't matter what the, what, the, what the Supreme Court of the land has said, I'm sure the diplomats themselves will be wondering, what's going on in this country? Mm. How, how can this happen? I mean, how, how are we sure that if we enter into any agreement with you, if we're into any treaty with you, and there's an order of court, be it in Nigeria or outside, that you will abide by it. It's a very wrong signal for the image of the country, you also know, at this point in time. I, I'd like to, um, I am a little perturbed um, by the I, I, by the seeming, because some, I, I, some people will say perhaps we should still give the CBN the benefit of the doubt, that it is not possible that the CBN will look the Supreme Court in the face and, and decide that it's still going to stay, stick by its guns. Uh, you know, there needs to be questions asked of, of the body as to precisely why it has taken us. And I want to look at perhaps the words that the CBN governor used. He said, no need for extension. Uh, do you think that that could imply that as a result of that ruling and the fact that the Supreme Court is going to be sitting today, perhaps there was really no need for them to take another decision to extend the deadline? And there's those who also argue that there's usually like a seven day window in which banks can still collect the old notes. And perhaps that might inform why the CBN governor would say no need for an extension. Uh, do you think that we're, we're misreading it here? Well, even though I want to give the benefit of doubt to the CBN governor, because it's unimaginable that he would have said the things that are attributable to him under the circumstance, it still remains to say that even if the CBN is of the view that there is no need, the implication the connotation and the effect of that statement that has been made by the CBN governor or attributable to the CBN governor has a negative effect, not only on law, but on the economy. Now, Naira is a, is a, is a currency of trade. A situation whereby you're not even sure from point A to B which Naira to use. 
Because you have the old Naira notes, one minute you are told it is legal tender, another minute you are told it's not legal tender. You don't even know which to trade with. It creates confusion in the polity. It creates confusion in the economy. So that alone is the, is, is the economic, the socioeconomic part of it. Now, on the legal part of it, whatever you do that tends to create anarchy or demean or belittle or ridicule the position of law as stated by the Supreme Court is contemptuous. So the effect of what he's saying, either by words or by conduct, affect negatively the pronouncement of the Supreme Court. And the ripple effect is that it threatens and challenges the rule of law in um, a society that is governed by the Constitution, like Nigeria. All right, let's bring in our colleagues in Lagos. Thank you, Chamberlain. Um, let, me, let me begin with uh, Mr. Leja, and I hope you can hear me, uh, Mr. Leja. Uh, you heard your colleague the other time, um, uh, Mr. Obole, say that the, the, the implication, when Chamberlain asked him a question along that line, that the implication of what the governor of the CBN has done is contempt of court, because I think it's Section 287 of the Constitution says, whenever a Supreme Court, the Supreme Court gives a ruling, it is binding on everyone, every agency of government that is concerned in that case. Now, we have all said that it is wrong. The implication, what are the implications and what are the consequences for anyone or agency of government that disobeys the ruling of the Supreme Court? What the law has always been clear, if it is proven that an individual or an agency has deliberately flouted another of the court, the consequences are clear. And the consequences is that uh, individuals who are operators of the agency flouting the order and whose the, 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 the disobedience could be traced to may be sanctioned by the law court even though it's a criminal uh, matter, and uh, it will entail further things being done before such individuals could be punished. And I guess that is why the CBN governor is maintaining this kind of attitude, because it is going to be a criminal proceedings. Certain things will have to be done. You have to serve certain forms. You have to then all sorts of arguments may come in. You know, you talk of and uh, proof beyond reasonable doubt. When you want to talk of uh, the content, you have to demonstrate that somebody has already done it, or the consequences are clear. But even beyond this now, I think uh, 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 we should not just confine ourselves to the criminal aspect of this matter. We have to look at it broadly. What does it pertain for us as a nation? especially in the international before the international community. Well, Mr. Legda, you are you're spot on on that, but just a quick follow-up on that question. Now, one of the questions we put to the SAN we had yesterday, Mr. Falano, was what is the timeline of obedience or compliance with any ruling of the Supreme Court? And since you've said, of course, that it's a matter that is still ongoing and all of that, does that mean that the ruling that was given, you know, concerning, you know, the, the extension or not of it, of the February 10 deadline, does that mean that there is a timeline to it that, you know, the CBN could still stretch it a little as opposed to being an order that should be effected immediately? Well, it is an interim order. It was granted to last till today. So up to this when, morning, when, when When should that order have taking uh, effect? Is it until, to, the, the until other, today or the other immediately? Takes, the order takes immediate effect once it is pronounced by the Supreme Court. Which and begs the question, just a second, which begs the question of the question that, ask, that we're asking around the, the consequences of not effecting that order immediately by the agencies of government concerned? Well, that's the point I'm making. The, the, the consequences are clear. Whoever has run foul of an express order of the court will be subjected to content proceedings. Like I said, it's another uh, the board game altogether. And all sorts of technical issues could be raised. Oh, the order was not made against me directly. The order was not made directly against the CBN, and so on and so forth. I think that's the kind of argument those who may be advising the CBN governor to throw this line, 
might have uh, uh, been advanced to him. But the point I am making is that uh, in a situation like this, there is an incumbent duty. Don't forget that uh, this order emanated and in fact is directed at the CBN. The Attorney General of the Federation through the CBN is asked to ensure that uh, it's, uh, the, 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 the pronouncement is suspended until today. So there is that duty obligation of the CBN to comply with that order until today. When the Supreme Court may decide to extend the term of the order or to uh, be, be vacate it, but until it is vacated, it subsists and the CBN governor is uh, in contempt of the court. But like I said, the procedure is quite elaborate before you now. But, but before we get that, before we get to that one, uh, Mr. Ledger, just one quick one before Bukola comes in. Just yeah. one quick one. Now, the president was the one that was literally directly addressed by that uh, ruling of the Supreme Court. Is that to say then that the president is the one that should have ordered the CBN, and if the C CBN governor didn't get that order from the president, then he's not under obligation to obey the, the, the ruling of the Supreme Court? Well, uh, the, the, the way it is is that once the Attorney General of the Federation is sued as a party in the matter, it is taken that it's representing the president and all the agencies that will be involved. So one would have expected in an ideal situation where there is synergy and well coordination between the agencies of government, that the, the federal attorney general would have advised the CBN governor on the duty on him to comply with that order. Don't forget that both the CBN governor and the attorney general of the federation are all appointees of the president. So uh, it's unfortunate that it has played out this way, but I think it will not have been out of the place, so whatever it is worth, for the president to also have advised the CBN governor. I don't want to use the word direct, but I think that that may be the appropriate one to have directed the CBN governor to comply with that order, which was given against the attorney general, including the president and the agencies that are subject matter of that litigation. In this case, the Central Bank of Nigeria. Thank you, Mr. Ledger. Let me now take you to the senior advocate in our Abuja studio. Mr. Gole, from timeline of implementation to the execution of the Supreme Court's order itself, and I refer to our conversation with uh, your colleague, senior advocate Falano, yesterday. He said in implementing the order, you don't break the law, uh, frowning on the governor's uh, but particularly governor of Kanu State, sanctioning a supermarket for rejecting the old note. So who holds the burden of implementing the Supreme Court order, especially where it's been, you know, uh, flouted as we, you know, uh, scrutinize the action of the CBN governor now? As we speak, the order is still subsisting. So who's supposed to implement the order that isn't implementing the order? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, we all have a duty to abide by that order. And by abiding by that order, invariably it means also implementing that order. But the forceful implementation, the, the assertive uh, implementation of that order is with law enforcement agencies, particularly the police. And to trigger, apart from the natural course of, of, uh, of events of um, you know, obedience of enforcement of law orders by the security agencies, particularly the police, to trigger um, another chain aspect of the, of the enforcement is a committal proceeding where there is um, uh, a disobedience to the order of court, which is a criminal process. Uh, like my uh, brother Silk had just said, that is a process which commences with, you know, forms and, you know, service and like a trial. But the actual enforcement of orders of court is basically um, the law enforcement agents. And in Nigeria, uh, the Attorney General plays a major role because he represents the government, are all, you know, the, the, the federal tier of, uh, of government and um, all the security agencies are under um, uh, the, the, the executive arm of government, the federal arm of government, and the attorney general as the chief law officer will advise um, for enforcement. 
So um, gladly he has already said that they, they would obey order of court, but it's unfortunate that the reports, if correct, that we're hearing from the um, from the same CBN governor and and other sectors are, are to the contrary. So I do so hope Mr. that there will be some. Mr. Some Gole, where we do not see that, where we do not see that, is it safe to conclude that the administration lacks the political will to obey the Supreme Court's ex parte order? First of all, it is unfortunate. I mean, we have a convoluted state uh, of, of affairs where it's not clear, uh, you know, you know, who is, whether the, to the, the dog is wagging the tail or the, the, the tail is, uh, is wagging, wa wagging the dog. Uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, that said, you know, it is something which all hands must be on deck to ensure that uh, there's compliance. There's just no two way about it. It must happen. I mean, the, 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 the Attorney General will, 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 will take appropriate steps to ensure that, uh, you know, the, the, the enforcement, because we all have a duty um, to preserve the sanctity of the courts and, and, and to maintain rule of law. Your spot on Here, there. As we wind down your spot now. Spot on there, Mr. Obole. Sorry, Malque. Your spot on there, Mr. Obole, when you say we all have a duty, but reports also suggest that uh, courts are rejecting the old narrow note. And you know, my colleague uh, uh, Chamberlain was asking, what should the legal community do? You know, in the face of the flagrant disregard of this court order. But when we have the courts uh, rejecting the old narrow notes from lawyers, where does that leave us? Well, um, yeah, I've also read that report myself. Um, but you see, we live in a society where we are all intertwined. The payments made to the court would not remain at the courts. It, they will go to the banks. And the banks themselves are also rejecting uh, old currency notes. And, and again, there's a confusion as to whether they, which of the currencies, you know, and you know, what exchange rate of Naira to Naira, you know, between financial institutions, POS, uh, agents and what have you. So yes, we hear that report, but I think that uh, I, I would want to uh, take that with a pinch of salt. I, I do know that um, the court environment, first of all, their payments are usually largely electronic these days, you know, these remita, you know, bank transfers and what have you. So um, I, I do want to believe that they, they, they would comply with um, the, the, the order of court by accepting the, the notes as they are, the old notes as they are, because that still is the order. So I have a doubt as to, as to, as to the reality of that situation, honestly. Well, as we wind down now, let me quickly uh, bring this up front. The, the CBN governor did meet with members of the House of Representatives. And part of what we heard as, you know, as part of what they came up with was the fact that the old note would not lose its value if it is presented to the CBN at any time. That the CBN has, uh, you know, instruments under its laws which mandates it to collect those old notes. So do you think that, I mean, even though the February 10 date, I mean, from what the CBN governor has said stands, do you think he's perhaps relying on the fact that people wouldn't lose their money? Because he, he, that was the reassurance he gave members of the House of Reps uh, to be able to say that that extension still, that, that, that there, will be no, there will be no need for an extension. Hello? Mr. Nigel, that's for you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I believe that uh, by the statement, it will still not uh, address the situation in which we are in. Because how many customers will take money to the CBN? How many customers will be able to buy with the, 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 the so-called old note now, since that they desire to buy? So I think he's just uh, trying to be clever by half. The arrangements about uh, taking these things to the CBN is uh, between commercial banks and uh, the CBN. We are talking about the relationship between customers, users of money, and uh, be, 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 those that they wish to, to do transactions with. So I think that's, that, uh, that uh, window has really not addressed the situation, and it has also not uh, be, exhibited compliance with the other Supreme Court. That's my take on that.
No, no, I already said that before, but I, I want to know what your expectations are uh, when the Supreme Court convenes much later today. Uh, we know that a number of state governors have indicated interest to join the suit. They've asked the Attorney General to be a part of it. What are your expectations as a lawyer and also a Nigerian who has, you know, felt the pains of the people and perhaps experienced it himself? Well, I don't want to preempt uh, what will happen in the court, but I believe that the attitude of the Supreme Court so far has been one that is uh, nationalistic, and I do not expect that uh, they will depart from that uh, course, because as the last court of the land, they have a duty to ensure that the economy is salvaged. And uh, in this instance, from uh, the CBA, to do otherwise may lead to chaos and anarchy. In the, in the nation. That's my take. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning. Mr. Kendi Eleja is a legal practitioner and also founder, head of practice at KK Eleja and Company. Thank you so much for coming on this morning, sir. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, <clears throat> well, we still have Mr. Gulli here with us. But, you know, uh, that particular part where the CBN appeared before the House of Reps and uh, made that statement, and then also remembering that um, there was a CBN Secular where they had extended the timeline, the deadline with which you could deposit your money with the banks from February 10 to 17. Now at this point, many are confused and wondering, are they still going to accept this money? Does that deadline subsist when he's still talking about February 10? Uh, so it's all just part of the confusion. So uh, what since they made that announcement, and now he spoke about February 10th, is that, which one do you think subsists? The, the one that is still being circulated by their own secular, can that still be right? People, will they still be within their rights, within the law, to go forward to the banks and deposit that money in spite of this February 10th date that all, that's all over the place? Well, that's the confusion we talk about. And the confusion now negates the the confidence we would have in our currency. As a legal tender, we should be able to have confidence that any time you present your currency, it is honored. Now, even amongst your own citizens, if your currency is not honored, not because they don't love your currency, but because of the discordant tunes from government agencies, particularly the chief custodian of the currency, which is the CBN. One minute they come up with a directive with the circular, another minute there's a pronouncement to another effect, another minute, you know, so all of this convolution puts us in a quandary. So that, 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 that really, it doesn't help the value of the Naira. It doesn't help, and, and besides, it puts, it puts the citizenry into greater penury. So that's the situation we have, and it's unfortunate. And that's what the Supreme Court sought to, to, to cure, by saying, hey, you know what, put a hold on this thing, you know, you know pending, a, you know, say today or a later date, and then issues will be canvassed, addressed, and then they'll take a decision one way or the other. But now here we are in a situation whereby we're further exacerbating the situation and saying, okay, no, we would hold on to the position that we took before now. So, so, so perhaps at the end of the day we'll have a clearer picture. But where we are now, it's... Um, but, um, no one really knows the situation. Well, really, I, I think that people, I feel like, uh, you know, this is, it's like we've been played like a yo-yo. You know, one minute we're high up, the next minute, you know, we're down. We, 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 we saw that fran the frantic move by the House of Representatives to hold that conversation yeah. with the CBN. And it would seem that after they had that conversation, you know, tempers were calm, there was a little less tension. And then when the February, the January 31 date approached, and we we saw almost the chaos at the ATM uh, branches, at the ATMs, etc., and bank branches. The CBN gave an extension, an extra 10 days, and we thought everything was coming down until we saw that, oh, it doesn't look like this currency is, is available. You, you know, I, I'm just wondering, this is not in the area of law now. This is nothing it has to do. When you look at your own level of transactions, do you really think that this is a policy that could have worked? I mean, the fact that the CBN intended to mop up so much and only wanted to give out so little because they wanted a lot of people to migrate uh, to, you know, the, the cashless platforms? Well, you know, um, across the world it's standard practice that, you know, after a number of years, your currencies are redesigned and um, 
uh, and remanaged, uh, you know, and the law provides for it, the CBN Act provides for it. However, the implementation in this, this, in this current scenario is where we have a problem. Now, talking about the CB, the um, meeting with the, uh, uh, the House of Reps, you yeah. know, it was a noble thing the House of Reps um, did by saying, look, we feel, we, we, we represent the people and we feel the pulse of the people. So look, CBN Governor, CBN, please come and tell us what's going on and how do we solve this problem to assuage the feelings of of you. But I, it appeared to me that what happened there was a placebo effect because it appeared that we got assurances from CBN that, you know, it's all okay, you know, like that. And then from there, boom, things apparently got worse. <laughs> because sometimes you move around town, uh, maybe around 8 p.m., and then you see hundreds and hundreds of people, women and children, you know, queuing at ATM stations and, you know, at banks and all of that, at that late hour, you know? You can imagine what will happen. And that's why many who were spoken to you know, outside the And you know studios, that some banks have been attacked. Yeah, you know? and several of them and even bank staff didn't go to work. You know, so they, they, in fact, some think that in, in the rural areas, that all of these things is just sophistry, that they don't know what's going on. And people are actually dying. We've seen videos of elderly senior citizens weeping, say they wanted to just buy some medication and they couldn't get it you because can't. they can access funds. So for them, this whole thing is just off history and it has huge implications. But we still have a president in this country. And many wonder, can the CBN, could the CBN be doing all of these things without the whether tacit or express permission or support or approval of the president? Well, one thing for sure is that a community reading of the CBN Act, particularly from section 18 to 20 to section 20, will tell you that, you know, acts of CBN mm -hmm. relating to currency um, redesign, swap, or whatever you needs the approval of the president. Mm -hmm. So it must come with, the, not even Minister of Finance, uh -huh. with the president. So um, one way or the other, yeah. the box stops on the table <coughs> of the president. Let me just bring you, because that, that date that we spoke about, it was a CBN secular which was released and then announced that deadline. So if you could just uh, bring it up on the screen. And so some parts of it, they, there was a paragraph, the very last paragraph of that release by the CBN, which was signed by him. That's why people are asking questions as to what does this then do? Or what does this stand in light of the CBN statements yesterday? So this is the last paragraph, last page of that CBN circular, which was signed by the CBN governor himself, which says, <clears throat> a seven-day grace period beginning on February 10 to February 17, 2023, in compliance with Section 20, Sub 3, and 22 of the CBN Act, allowing Nigerians to deposit their old notes at the CBN after the February deadline when the old currency would have lost its legal tender. So it means that uh, now with this, people Sorry, have can a... you go to section 20, subsection 3? Let's, let's have a verbatim presentation of it. Of this... Uh, it's the CBN Act, not yeah, of that, the Constitution. Yeah, that's the CBN Act. Yeah, I was talking about the CBN Act. I think it's making... talking about CBN Act. Yes, it's making yeah. reference to the... Yeah, this, yeah, the CBN was making reference to their own... To the CBN Act, Act yes. Please now, can, because you, this... can you please that section 20 of the... Okay, subsection the, 3 the, we'll, we'll bring it out right now, but right, this question now, this is the press statement by... Just reading the headline here. The press statement by Gordon Mayfield, Governor, Central Bank of Nigeria, January 29, 2023, on progress of implementation of new redesigned currency by the Central Bank of Nigeria. So this is what was said that today. So one wonders now, people are saying that the banks are not even accepting the old notes. So you then wonder, but this is a directive from the CBN themselves. What do people do? Yeah, you see, um, indeed, after the closure, the eventual closure of the date for um, currency swap, if you may, Banks will transact with the CBN concerning, you know, exchange of notes. And, and it's, at that point in time, it's not an individual thing between uh, bank customers or regular users. So it is between the banks, the commercial yeah, but, banks. But with this, before that 17 deadline, 
citizens can take their old notes to the bank. That's what they understand from this. Yeah, but the question is, is it really happening? The banks are not even accepting the old notes now. I have that experience. I don't know if it's other banks, but I have been to a particular bank with old notes and they're like, you know what, if you have, uh, you know, find a way of paying it into your, how, I, how else can I pay it into my so, account? But when, when the CBN said, bring it to the bank or to the CBN, is it to the banks or to the CBN or is it the same maybe, thing? Maybe they mean, have an arrangement with the bank where it is put in a vault and then... A vault? I don't the know. Vault is not No, 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 no. It, 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 where, where at that point in time, they would eventually, at the close of the date, the, the terminal date, mm -hmm. they will relate with CBN. Some kind of policy that they have, I mean, it's internal to them. I wouldn't know Indeed. that part of it. And that's why I said perhaps we need to, you know, reread the CBN governor's words when he says no need for an extension. He doesn't quite say we stand by our February 10 deadline. But I'm, I've been trying to look for uh, the BOFIA now. Uh, yes. No, CBN Act. It's different from the BOFIA, yeah, is it? Yes, it is. Oh, okay, so I think we, we might need to find the CBN Act. Uh, we'll look for the CBN Act. Um, look for the CBN Act. And, Particularly and see, section, 20, section, section 20, 20, 20, subsection 3. That but has been made given, the, given, given what he has told the banks, because that's supposed to be a circular to the banks, yes. shouldn't that have served as, you know, you know, uh, some reassurance to citizens that perhaps there was a, an implicit compliance with the order of the Supreme Court, perhaps? Well, uh, I, I wouldn't think so. Because the effect of it, which is, you know, palpable for all to see, is that there's that of non-compliance. That's the effect that we see. Because the confidence you will have in your currency to say that it is still legal tender by virtue of the order of the Supreme Court, the question is, do we have that confidence? The banks themselves, from what they exhibit, don't have that confidence. The citizens, if you can't use that as a medium of exchange for trade, then what are we talking about? Okay. Because the people, people would prefer to use the, um, the new currency rather than the old currency. All right. Yeah. So that's to be an act which you speak about, yes. which talks about banks, currency notes, and coins to be legal tender. Yeah. It says 21, the currency notes issued by the bank shall be legal tender in Nigeria at their face value for the payment of any amount. Two, the coins issued by the bank shall, if such coins have not been tampered with, be legal tender in Nigeria at their face value up to such amount or amounts as may be determined from time to time by the bank. Three, notwithstanding subsection one and two of this section, the bank shall have power if directed to do so by the president and after giving reasonable notice in that behalf to call in any of its notes or coins on payment of the face value thereof and any note or coin <coughs> excuse me with respect to which a notice has been given under this subsection shall on the expiration of the notice cease to be legal tender but subject to section 22 of this act shall be redeemed by the bank upon demand. Now, the, sub the, the section 22 that it talks about there relates to um, defaced currencies, which will not, which will not apply. They will not take defaced. You know, those ones are for destruction. Okay, I'm trying to look at it now, but I, I'm, perhaps we should read it. Just the legal language can sometimes be so convoluted. Now, now, <laughs> sub three there. Yes. Uh -huh. Is is what the CBN guideline says. It's uh, okay. It's even on the screen. Yes. That's is what the, the CBN guideline seems, seems to be taking, deriving its authority from. Yes. Do you want me to uh -huh. read it again? Yeah. Which one? Twenty or twenty-three. Twenty-three. Or? It says the the bank shall have power if directed to do so by the president and after given reasonable notice in that behalf to call in any of its notes or coins on payment of the face value thereof and any note or coin with respect to which a notice has been given under this subsection shall on the expiration of the notice cease to be a legal tender but subject to section 22 of this act mm -hmm. shall be redeemed by the bank 
upon demand. Let me add 22 in case you want me to read that. All right. Uh, 22 one says, a person shall not be entitled to recover from the bank the value of any lost, stolen, mutilated, or imperfect note or coin. Two, the circumstances in which and the conditions and limitations subject to which the value of the lost, stolen, mutilated, or imperfect note or coins may be refunded ex gratia shall be within the absolute discretion of the bank. All right. Well, first I'm saying that the subsection referred to there as an exception uh -huh. relates to mutilated co uh, currencies and the likes. Yeah. Now, on that section 23 uh, there, mm -hmm. the provision is clear. The, after the expiration of the date, they can redeem. That is CBN redeeming. At that point in time, it is not an all-commerce transaction. Mm -hmm. It is CBN redeeming upon demand. And the demand here is between the banks, that's what Bonnie said, between the banks and the CBN. Because as regular citizens, you don't have access to CBN. You don't have any direct relationship with CBN. It is only the banks that can relate with CBN. So that demand can only come from the banks. So when the demand, when, when the banks, from whatever currencies they have, if they are not able to send those currencies to CBN before that expiration date, whatever currencies they have can be taken to the bank to be honored after that date. Now, before that particular date, you can take your old currencies to the bank. The CBN has already said that after the date the terminal date that they are prescribed. Which is now February 17. Which for now would say, you know, uh, I don't want to say it's February. But that's what they no, said. I, I, I don't want to say so, you know, in the okay. light of the order of court and the light oh, of the fact okay. that the matter is still ongoing. I I'd like to leave that open ended. All right. You know, uh, that's my choice. <laughs> Pardon me at this moment. Yeah, so, but the point I'm making is at that point in time, the currency you can no longer take to the bank. So if you can no longer take to the bank, from where would the bank now take that currency to the CBN? Mm. Yeah, so maybe the banks are in contravention of even the circular of the CBN. Should we blame the banks here? Uh, maybe they, they are misunderstanding, uh, or maybe perhaps the CBN, uh, the, the circular is yet to circulate to, <laughs> to all branches of the banks, because it might surprise you that some banks might collect it and some banks might reject it. Wouldn't that just be a, a, a result of perhaps information hasn't percolated as it ought to have? Well, I wouldn't know that aspect of it, but, uh, but I'd like to look at the effect. And the effect, like we all know, and I'm sure you're also affected by these decisions, you one way or the other. Absolutely. Or somebody you we're know affected. is also affected. You know, we have aged parents in, you know, in, uh, you know. I don't have any parents, for instance. Uh, I don't know if my boy does. Mm. I don't. <laughs> so I'm affected. Yes. No, I think the you're right should, on that. The, you're right on the money. The you money probably, I don't you have. You probably have better access to to uh, to the new notes than than some of us. <laughs> she, she, right? I told you she she does she she you know she she might. Yeah. But you know I, I, I wish that we were a fair representation of Nigerians. Um, you know I, I wish that if uh, almost everyone in this studio were a fair representation oh. of Nigeria because when you go out there is it, it, is when you begin to understand the impact of this policy. And, and for some people, they think that perhaps that's where this policy was de you know, derived from. Maybe there is an expectation that many Nigerians are like us. Or like, because if you ask us, I mean, if you ask someone like me, how much transaction have I done you know, with cash or vessels online, mm. the chances are very high that perhaps 80% of the transactions have been, have, done, have been online. So, but when you go out there, you see that there are people who depend on a day-to-day -day mm. basis. Their existence depends on having cash at hand in the marketplace, hawkers, even beggars. You, the the grievous questions to ask yeah, about, even yes, yeah. about the implication of not having cash in circulation in the country. Uh, you know, so that question you ask, I mean, even though presenters rarely take on, <laughs> they rarely answer questions, uh, it, it does raise further questions as to how in touch are the people who make policies with the average or the everyday Nigerian? I think that's a question to ask here. Well, that's appropriate. It's an appropriate question to ask. And uh, we also need leaders with empathy. People, should, leaders should feel the pulse, feel the pain that the citizenry feel, and react responsibly to that. However well intended a policy is, if it inflicts 
immediate and future pains on your citizens. I mean, the end of it is that, would you really say that's a good policy in, the term, in terms of its implementation? You know, we'll talk about reasonable time. Uh, yeah. The question again you want to ask is that the time that we have, the, the, the time prescribed by CBN for this currency swap, is it reasonable in the circumstance? The population of the country today, the amount of money available in circulation, not captured by, by the banking system. Mm -hmm. The effect of technology, or lack of it, on the citizenry. Only yesterday, I think, MTN was down for about, uh, for a number of hours. Yeah. If you were stuck in a place where you needed to do cash transfer, you know, probably at the airport or, you know, in some place where you needed to do cash transfer, you didn't have cash. You fall, back on you fall back on technology. You were in the hospital, if you were in the hospital to make payments, and they are waiting for you to make payments or buy drugs. For four hours, you can't transfer. You don't have cash. So there, this, there are people who have experienced that. Yeah. So, so these are the effects that we're talking about. Yeah, you know, and, and so, so government should do, should do something you know, you know, that will ameliorate the pains that we all are facing. Well, they can't claim not to have this data. They were the ones who are telling the whole country that uh, these are the amount of people who are unbanked, these are the amount of people in the rural areas who we want to bring in. So they have all that data. So they cannot feign ignorance on this one. But we have to thank you for coming on. Uh, Harris Ogwele, a senior advocate of Nigeria. My we pleasure. will be back in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to the 2023 verdict. As you've seen, the Major General Obi Omahi joins us. He's a former GOC 81 Division Chairman, Southeast Security Committee. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on the program today. Well, uh, the news that came through about the court decision to dissolve the Ibubago security outfit, of which you know, the Southeast had tried to set it up and ensure that they that. fill in the gap. How did that, How come, did to that come to you that when you story? heard that story? Temblin, uh, good morning. Temblin, uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I didn't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, but can you hear me now? I hear you. All right, so the story about the court decision to dissolve it, it, it came with mixed feelings for a lot of people who had several impressions about it. What was your impression when you heard it? Well, I, I think um, well, I, I think speaks um, of, uh, it speaks of a society that is a society that is deeply disjointed. Where the judiciary, where the is, not judiciary is not feeling the executive, the executive, not, the executive is not feeling the legislature. Uh, we are not. It's not. Uh, uh, we are not. Like, it's we not. Have have a, it's like we don't have a system. And that's the only way I can. And that's the only way I can describe that court, that, uh, court judgment. But. Well, but what did you, what, what did you for instance, expect, for instance, the court to have taken on board in light of this now? In light of this now? The board could have the taken, board could on, have board taken the on board current the situation, current security situation, security situation in Nigeria, situation in Nigeria knowing that the governor. The can governor use, can use uh, such means, uh, such as, uh, means uh, as vigilante, uh, uh, vigilante a bubago, and all such, all such facilities to help his secure, 
peace. And that state. is what is happening. And that is what is happening in the in north. most places in the also north. Happening in is the south also east. happening in the southwest. So south I do west. not know why so that, of south, know why that of south east should be different. Would you say that? Would you say that there were sufficient, um, you know, safeguards, um, you know, safeguards put in place? Because, in place, know, because as we know, our laws do not support the creation of state police. And it would seem that you know, Ebubeago was perceived as going against the law or uh, is perceived as some form of state police which could be in contravention of the constitution? Well, <laughs> I think um, there has been a call for governors to secure their states. We can't be speaking from both sides of the mouth. If there is a call on the governors to do what they, to do what they, to secure the citizenry, to secure lives and property. I think uh, that cannot by any means against any constitution. Mm. It, they, well, you do know that the governors, I mean, whenever it is that they're sworn in, they swear to uphold the constitution. And we all know, I mean, it's something that we all know, that there is no provision for state police as we speak. It was one of the loopholes that was used against uh, the creation of um, Motekun. And we saw how the Southwest governors rallied round to try and make sure that, you know, whatever loopholes that were there, uh, they tried to close it in with regards to the creation of Amotekun. That's why I'm asking if there were any safeguards put in place, because if anyone challenged it in a court of law, some people would say that, that would, it would have fallen flat on its face. Were you prepared for this legal loophole that could be exploited, even though you have a noble idea? It still has to be done within the realm of law, doesn't it? Well, thank you very much. But uh, it is the same constitution that calls the state governors, chief security officers of their states. And uh, the state assembly also passed uh, a bill which was signed into law by the various governors concerning these uh, security outreaches. What, what do you think the implication of this will be in the region? I, I, I guess, you see, the truth is, Number one, I empathize with the federal government. The hands are full. There are security challenges all over the country. Okay, so, and what it leaves the federal government with is to allow state police to come into force. And in the absence of state police, all these security outfits in the various states should be allowed and empowered to work effectively. Okay, so I, I, I think the only way forward for this country, as far as security is concerned, is to quickly put in place state police. In the absence of state police, let these vigilantes, let these security, various regional security outfits be empowered lawfully, empowered lawfully, legally, to operate and, giving the, and be given the opportunity or the powers to be armed, to be trained very effectively for them to function, to help stabilize the security of this nation. Oh. But, but at the moment now, uh, assuming this were to follow through this disbandment, several persons who were in this outfit, have, they have some form of training or the other. How do you see them integrated into the society if this subsists? Well, it, 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 we are creating a monster. That's the way I see it. Um, like you pointed out, there is a, a, a lacuna, constitutionally speaking. Um, there is no state police allowed, yes, that is true. But the Constitution has empowered the governors as chief security officers of their various states without giving them the way with all to play that role. So there is a lacuna constitutionally and, uh, you know, on ground, there is a lacuna. So the federal government should stop holding tight to the issue of being in charge of instruments of violence. That is why they are holding on to police, holding on to the armed forces. The armed forces, rightly so. But police, no. That is 
not acceptable in any way. He who feels it knows it. Only the state governors who know how it pains them in the issue of security can put in place police that fits their environment that they can control and use effectively to secure lives and property. That, I think, is what will work for this nation. And that will help the president, commander-in-chief, to effectively be in charge of giving peace and security to the entire nation through help using the police and then also doing it directly. Well, I'm wondering... I mean, uh, because part of the complaints that were against Ibu Beago, I mean, for, and the fears that people had about the creation of state police, uh, it was, seems that it's a manifest uh, with the creation of Ibu Beago. Uh, there were human rights abuses reported, as, particularly in a Boeing state. Uh, there were reports that Ibu Beago was used as an instrument to terrorize or to intimidate political opponents. Um, and, and it would seem that this is how come Ibu Beago has um, been dissolved. From, from your own experience, were there sufficient internal safeguards to prevent against human rights abuses uh, that you know, Ibu Beago was reported to have engaged in while it existed? <laughs> Let me correct an impression. I was the chairman of Southeast Security Committee. I am no longer in charge. But I can hold brief for the governors to some extent. Um, the, the, the truth is that even the federal police is also used as instruments of intimidation operation. So that's cannot be a reason why police cannot be created at the state level. Because police is used for all those evil or ill purposes, even as a federal institution. So if it, a police is created at the state level, perhaps it may do more or less than what is being done with federal police. So that cannot be an excuse. So oppression is oppression, whether it's coming from the federal government or it's coming from the state. Not that I, I, I agree that it should be. But what I think can be done, you see, the problem with the Nigerian police is lack of training. If they train well and they know the rules of law, they will understand that the civilians are the laws. They are the people they have sworn to protect, they are rather the boss and not themselves. So if the state police is allowed to come in place, to come on stream, it depends on the training the governments give, uh, the state governments give them. It depends on the hierarchy, the framework, the command and control that is built into the system. That is exactly what their, their output will reflect. So what would you, uh, as we wind down on this one now, what would you advise the state governors to do? Because there will be people in the area who will say, well, following this court judgment, no such person under the guise of a Bibago can do anything to us. So if anyone comes trying to do anything, we know that that is not right. So there might be confusion or anarchy or people taking laws into their hands. So now the governors have got to do something about some of these things. As being in your position, what would you advise them to do concerning this current situation now? I, I think um, that institution, I'm not holding brief for the, uh, for the Southeast state governors. I say that again. But that institution has its own positive side. If you ask the police, the police will tell you that Ebu Bago has been of great help to them. And that is why community policing is important. As far as I'm concerned, Ebu Bago is bridging the gap that exists in terms of community policing. Because 
the Ebubago, uh, those in Ebubago, they belong to communities. They know the situation in communities. They know the bad guys in their various communities. So they give information to the police concerning these people. They make arrests of such people and hand over to the police. So I think it, it, when some disgruntled, the, the, the Nigerian um, uh, opposition must always, it's always disgruntled at all times. They always disgruntled, even when nothing ill has happened to them, they will raise a shout to draw sympathy, to draw attention to themselves. Oh, to give the impression they are working hard is just that the, the state government institutions is oppressing them and all, all of that. All those are gimmicks of politicians. And we must build this nation beyond all these sentiments, all these emotions, all these uh, uh, kind of gimmicks. I think for me, if I am to advise the governors, I will say number one, you have to go to court to discharge this, uh, uh, this, this, this uh, um, judgment. Number two, you have to do everything possible to give proper training to this Ebubago. And don't use the dregs of the society to form parts of this Ebubago. Use those who have at least, you know, a, a certain level of education. And then let them be effective command and control in Ebubago so that there must be some people at the various points in, of the hierarchy that will bring discipline, control into the behaviors of uh, the uh, personnel of Ibubago. That, that, that's what I can advise uh, the governors to do. Uh all right, then. We know you do have a tight schedule. We have to thank you for coming on. Major General Obi Umahi, former chairman, Southeast Security Committee. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much. The acquisition of these items was to demonstrate the determination of the post leadership to advance Mr. President's commitment to a reformed, modernized, fully equipped, highly motivated, and citizen-focused police force that is reoriented to the virtues of professionalism, respect to rule of law, due process, professional efficiency, and best international practices in our internal security mandates. Your Excellency, sir, they are also procured with a view to bridging the operational gaps in the Nigeria police, position the force for the stabilization of the national security order ahead of the 2023 general election, and also guarantee the attainment of a peaceful, skilled, and credible exercise the most operationally efficient in the most operationally efficient manner. As an idea they've put together, mm -hmm. the whole thing is targeted at confusing people. And our job is to convince people. So once we get to the people before them, or get to the people immediately after them, as long as we the conversation that is coming to the people is not for only one side. So if you, if you just lie supine and say, well, I don't have all the arsenal, I cannot put uh, 30 adverts in one hour in different um, media spaces. But you can reach people, you can get people to talk to people, we can we reach people in the organic uh, uh, places, where anywhere people are gathered, we go there and talk to them. Uh, so you try to be asymmetric in the approach, because what you want to do, uh, in addition to that, is that we're trying to run away from the same um, default position, where you go and start looking at people with deep pockets to come and start helping you to push your campaign because if oh, you do well, you that, need funds for to prosecute elections you need funds but you need legitimate funds and you need moderate funds you need to we must change our politics if you want to change our governance and if you don't change our governance we cannot change the state of the country so you must start from there you don't want you to be you don't want to be captured because people know that if you're running a national election mm -hmm. Before, shortly before you midway, you are going to start looking for resources. So they position themselves.
Yeah. How about that presidential picture? How do you like that? <laughs> well, this is this is almost like uh, this is for the princes in Ondo. <laughs> but you can manage it. <laughs> <laughs> manage? Did you hear that? Well, welcome to the program, Mr. Dubai. I mean, he's the presidential candidate of the SDP. So we're following through now uh, from what you told us the last time in terms of how your campaign is going, the strategy you plan to deploy to ensure you achieve the aim for which you're running this election. So how is that playing out now? Well, it's playing out well. Of course, um, it's in no fair way to campaign. Uh, it's, uh, we don't run shows. Like, uh, it, you know, it looks like the common way to campaign in Nigeria is to set up series of TV shows. So you set up like a studio, I see you are Michael Jackson coming for performance. You fill the stadium with people whom you transported there, and then you play music and spend a few minutes uh, saying a few things. Uh, mostly you are so tired, you start uh, mixing dates up, you start mixing names up and things like that. And then everybody disperses. But what we decided to do is to go to the communities themselves. Uh, rather than taking them to the studio uh, to look for us, we go uh, to almost every community. So we have advanced parties who live in that community and they spread the message. And then we drive through the community, we go to these different citadels in that community. We go to where people live. So when they are describing their condition, we can see it by ourselves. And when we are talking to them about solutions uh, that we can prefer, they can see that we have seen the problem. We are within the community. And uh, we, we travel day and night to try to get to everyone. And the, the, the reception has been wonderful. And we hear sure. most people say, oh, you are the first presidential candidate in history yeah, to but be here. I thought politicians or political parties use that as a show of strength test of their metal in whichever area they go to. So if you don't adopt that method, then you go individually to communities. How do you then psychologically uh, get to that level where you say, yes, I have a base here? Or how do you also galvanize other people to say, OK, I could pitch my tent with this party because I've seen what they can do with the amount of people around them? Well, there are three things to look at in that one. One, we're not trying to impress anyone. We're trying to let people understand the condition of the country. And w when you are in the community, you know whether you are popular in that community or not. Because you hold meetings there regularly. So there are around 76,846 words. So people in that world, they know themselves. They know that we hold SDP meetings here. They know the issues. So I don't need to bring someone from Makodi uh, to come and meet someone in, in Joss to convince the man in Joss that the party is popular. Everyone is in his community. We do hold uh, rallies, but we, rallies will be done by the local people. Uh, and it's for those who are doing this uh, crowd renting and uh, uh, crowd trafficking, they, they have... Crowd trafficking? It's crowd trafficking. You carry people across state lines sometimes to fill up a stadium, and uh, you take uh, drone pictures. And then you carry the same people. You see them community all over. So. That's their style because they believe that they can create a sense of momentum from it. But we are interested in finding out whether the people who are responding to us understand what we are about and they know that governance is for them and that they have to make very good choices. So we go to the community and we do that. At the end of the day, you will see that people fill stadiums with hundreds of thousands of people when right. the election result comes out, yeah. they don't get 10%. Okay. And for us, you will see how the outcome will be. So that's basically our approach to it, because we want the people to know that politics is not entertainment. Mm -hmm. Politics is about understanding the issues All right. and dealing with them.
right, welcome back. So we'll just go ahead and bring in our colleagues in Lagos to also have, they've got questions for you, Mr. Adewale. Go ahead, guys. Thank you, Chamberlain. Let me begin, uh, uh, Mr. Adewale, by first of all, congratulating you on how far you have gone. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious to know what the feedback has been um, because uh, yeah, with your approach to the uh, to the campaigns, especially when you say you go to the grassroots, meeting people one on one, and all of that. What are some of the feelers that you have gotten from people? I know you said that some say that you are the first presidential campaign, beg your pardon, first presidential candidate to come to them, but you're vying for the office of president, not local government. So one one is wondering what are your feelers uh, that you, what are the feelers you are getting. And what are the sentiments that you are getting from people about your campaign and the entire uh, 2023 election processes? Well, the feelings I'm getting about it, uh, from the people, one is that uh, the, it looks like the political parties have not reached the communities. Basically, what is happening is that people go to the major cities, um, most likely the state capital, and they landed in a helicopter or uh, some aircraft, they all drive in long convoy, they shut their windows down, and police totting guns everywhere. And they go into an enclosure, a stadium, like a Roman, like Roman gladiators. And they come there and do all the two hour drama, and then they go out. So there are, maybe the assumption is that the people from the stadium will now go to the various communities and start to say, I saw the man uh, on, on the stage, and he said a few things. So what I see is that any community we go to, people are open, they, are, they welcome us, and then when you tell them what is going on, in fact, in reality, some of them ask you basic questions like, what is the day of the election, and things like that. So it shows to you that there's a lot of community communication that needs to be done, uh, that people. So there are two things I want us to understand. One, there is a dialogue, which is like a monologue, among politicians where you talk to yourself. So you take your party activists, you take your uh, state chairman, you take all the people working in your party, all of you put yourself in the stadium talking to one another, and you're all clapping for each other. It's different from when you are talking to the people who are not affiliated to your party, who don't know what your party means, and start to ask questions. So th that, those are the things I found again. The third thing I found again is that there is a different world on the ground than the world which we reflect in the media. So the, on the ground, people want to be spoken to. People want to tell you things. And the last thing I also discovered, which is the last I will say to that question, is that politicians who go to rallies are going there to talk to the people. But what we find out in, when we're going about the country is that they want to talk to the politician. They want to talk to us. So going to the community may, gives an opportunity to hear from them directly. You will notice that uh, in many of the TV shows that you cover, uh, called campaign, it's only a one-way one way communication. The politician is always talking in front of the microphone. He doesn't hear anything back. But in our own, it's an exchange. Uh, we go to the common people, we go to the youth, we go to the women, we go to rural area, we go to the traditional rulers, we go to the religious community. So we're able to get an aggregate view of what people think about politics, what they think about our party, what they think about our manifesto, but I think, overall, they agree with us that we have to deal with poverty and we have to deal with insecurity. So those are the feelings I'm getting. And I believe that more should be done. And next time I can advise INEC, you should make campaign season a year long so that people can interact more, so that people understand the condition of the people. I've done extensive study before I decided to run for president. But I tell you honestly, if I didn't go around this community, I will not be a good president. Because going around the communities, seeing their condition, seeing the way they live, seeing their, the fact that they have an understanding of their problem, they even have solutions to many of them if the government will not stand in the way. It makes me feel happy that I went around the community and I'm still going around. We're going to be in Adamawa today and Taraba tomorrow. I will go on like that. We'll go around the country until the last whistle is blown. Well, looking at the pictures on the screen right now, it would seem like you know, your party had its fair share of rallies also, uh, no matter what the size is. And speaking of which, um, there, there are, you are not unaware that every party has had their uh, shot at one disagreement or the other 
And one might say that your party know less because we understand that uh, uh, from information available in public space says that your party's uh, uh, chairman in Lagos State may have dumped the, the, the party and the exco may have done the, dumped the party and went to another party altogether. And we've also heard cases, I mean, it's not the only one, it's your party is not the only one that that has happened to, but how is that and a number of other issues like that working for or against your chances or your party's chances at the polls? No, look, like we said, those things don't really matter much. We dealt with that issue earlier. Uh, a very energetic and uh, committed member of our party, uh, who was chairman of our party in Lagos State, uh, he went to another party because uh, she was interested in the governorship candidate uh, in her own home state. And we have a very large uh, executive in Lagos State. Our executive in Lagos State is, um, at a minimum, the executive of the party is over 3,000. We have an executive up to the world level. Uh, and 16 of them, uh, according to them, left. And we found out that they're not involved to 16. And uh, the person hasn't spoken against the party. He's not campaigning against us. Even when she was asked in the media and uh, said, uh, who, which platform do you still believe in? She said, I still believe in the SDP as the best platform, and I'm still going to vote for the presidential candidate of the SDP. I just made a personal decision because I have a few friends who are running for office uh, for governorship in my state, and I thought I could assist them. So that is not a crisis for us. And as you know, on a um, daily basis, hundreds join the party. Uh, so what made that to be something that is worth your attention is that the party that she joined uh, celebrated it so much and spent so much, maybe millions of naira, uh, by our time and advertising their achievement. But if we were to do that, then we would spend trillions because every day people join our party. There, are, there has been political parties whose entire zona executive came to join us. We just welcomed them quietly and they asked them to go and learn the SDP manifesto and we continue to do the job. So we are not interested in um, shows and fanfare. Uh, what we are interested in is that the message you get to the people, because the solution to Nigeria's problem <coughs> lies in the mind of the voter. The quality of understanding of the issues by the voter would affect the way they vote. And you can't get the politics right until you raise the quality of voters. So much effort has been made about the quality of candidates. But I think the quality of understanding of the issues by the voters, uh, issue-based campaign is OK, but issue-based campaign is better when the, candidate, when the electorate is an issue-based electorate. And that's what we are trying to communicate in what we do. So all these little dramas is because they don't understand that the SDP is just not trying to win the presidency and other elections. We are trying to win it in a different way, in a way in which uh, the politics will be clean, it will be clear, and there will be a proper social contract with the Nigerian people. And then you can go out there, and when you are in gov go uh, government, the people understand why they voted you in, and they have a measurement that is consistent with the manifesto of the party, <coughs> chapter two of the Constitution of Nigeria, a fundamental objective and directed principle of state policy so that we can abolish poverty, we can make social investment, and we can run a very humble government that people are not expecting too much drama and uh, fanfare. They're expecting a government that works at the most yeah, elementary yeah, level. Yes, still on your... Of Mr. So that's Bio. what we're trying to achieve. Yes, yeah, still on your people-oriented campaign. I mean, you know, we're having a conversation earlier on on the program about the need for, you know, the en engagements with the people, you know, by the presidential candidate, you know. Uh, some would say that uh, it's laudable to help you understand the issues. And, but then again, when we compare you, the other campaigns with what we uh, saw on the screen earlier of your campaign, one would wonder how expansive your reach is and uh, ask perhaps if uh, you're not campaigning on a larger scale because you do not have the financial muscle to do so. So how expansive is you know, the visits to the rural areas and to the communities? How expansive it is, is it across the 774 local governments? And if you had money to uh, make it more expansive, wouldn't you, uh, you know, execute something on a much larger scale? OK, we are now discussing scales. One, there are 176,846 polling units so across the country. So if you are present in all of them, you have a large scale. 
I think we should not mistake uh, large for loud. So people have loud campaigns. It doesn't mean that they have a reach. If I go around, for example, when I went to uh, Damawa State, I went as far as Mobi, Madagali, places where uh, presidential candidates don't go. Now, I went around uh, 263 wards in Adamawa State talking to people. Now, if somebody were to go to Yola and gather 30,000 or 50,000 people in a stadium in Yola or Rama Square, they will say, oh, what a large crowd. But do you know the uh, millions of people that I was able to interact with? So that's number one. Number two, we are not asking for more money. More money is criminal. More money is illegal. Because there is a legal limit of how much you must spend in an election. So it is not about you looking for more money. Now, if I were to spend all the money I have personally, I would exceed even the INEC guidelines. So we need to understand that it's not about more money. We are trying to take more, we are trying to do politics of less money. We are trying to tell people that politics should not be about money. So you don't go around adding more money to a politics that's already awash with too much money. So that is basically what we are trying to tell our people. You know, the Nigerian politics is like running a marathon. But the marathon, marathoners don't obey the rules. So you will have 18 people running a marathon. So where one or two will be running, the other person will come with his uh, sports car and put it on the track and be using the sports car to run the same marathon. The other person will bring a helicopter to run the same mar marathon. In the end, uh, you will say, well, all of them are running, are running the same marathon. It's, that's not a fair way to run a marathon. But we, who know the rules, Olympic rules of marathon, know that you must run it on your feet to be a legitimate marathon. We are not going to now go and buy Mercedes and put it on the track and be speeding away and say we are running so, an athletic so have marathon. You traversed, so what we are doing is, Mr. Adibayo, as we are trying to win the election... Have you traversed the 774 local governments of Nigeria in your campaigns? Okay, number one, I, before even running for office, have gone to 774 local government. That's well established. Then in the course of this campaign, we have teams. You must have seen some of them, if your reporters want to report it. We have teams that run at um, local government, first at polio unit level. We have teams for ward level. We have teams for every local government level. Then we have teams for zona and all of that level. Then, as a presidential candidate myself, what I try to do is to go to every senatorial district and every federal constituency, because it would be uh, practically impossible for me to touch every of the 176,846 polling units. But we are present, the presidential campaign is present in each of them. But when I go to a state, I spend an average of two or three uh, days, then we go around all the zones, we see every uh, palace, we see every... Uh, the school, every um, uh, trading group, so, every so, so it group. Seems... So we go to places that uh, are impossible for you to imagine that we can get to those places. We cross the river, we cross the mountains, we do whatever. We have yeah. uh, a, a fleet of uh, 40 donkeys and a fleet of 35 camels uh, doing work for us in Yobe State. If you go to Jakosko and other places in Yobe, you will see uh, the SDP, apart from having the horse, we have donkeys. We have cameras. We try to so, reach so people. Seems, the idea is It seems, Mr. Adebayo, pardon me now, it seems that you're satisfied with the work you've done in terms of campaigning. And uh, you've been quoted as saying that despite uh, the endorsement giving the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, you are still going to win. How so if you're not even named among the top four presidential candidates in the race? I, I'm not here for a naming ceremony. The most important thing is that you can name who you want. The most important thing is that you are trying to first do your duty, that you have a message for the people. Have you actually carried the message for the people? You are like someone, I see myself as someone who has a, a, a democratic vaccine, and I'm to fascinate the community. I have to carry the vaccine to them before I know whether the vaccine works or not. So I am not looking for a shortcut where I have endorsers, I have all sorts of people. Those who have their own role to play. What I'm trying to do is to say I am trying to understand the country and getting people to understand me. So we're going around uh, the country. Now, it may be that the, system, the method will work. It may be that it will have some shortcomings. But it, the, what we have adopted is that we must carry the message to the people. 
we must go around the country. Are you the way adjusting, it used to be are you adjusting your Republic, position now? The way it used to be done in Second Republic. Are you adjusting your you position go around to say... everywhere and pass Mr. Adebayo, are you adjusting your position now to say you may win or you may not win? I think that if a politician has not gone to the point of hubris, if a politician is still a human being with some uh, rationality, you know that nobody is guaranteed to win a presidential election or any election at all. Just like you are going to play a match, you, you try to win, but you know that the possibility that you may not win. So what we are doing now is to make sure that we win. That is why you see me in your studio. That's why you, you will see me uh, later today in, uh, in, in Adamawa that you will see me tomorrow in, in uh, Taraba, and you will see me in other parts of the country, you see me in Benue. I've been in Nasarawa for about four days, gone to every community that they haven't seen a presidential candidate before. All of this effort is to make you win. And you are getting, you are gauging from what people are telling you, whether the message is getting there. We are improving the messaging. We, I realized in some community when I started that I will go and start uh, speaking so, so eloquently only for me to discover that the majority of the people I was speaking to did not understand English at all. So we started now going with uh, uh, interpreters and things like that. So you learn every day as you are trying the system. The idea is for you to be authentic in your messaging. The idea is for you to actually want to reach the people. So the idea is to see that what you are saying is being received by the people and that they are not just uh, sharing T-shirts and, and face cap and, uh, and, cara and they're running around uh, with music. So many of the uh, people who are making these noises, they are still campaigning like the old, where all you needed to do was a show, and then on the day of the election, you rig the election. But if you are trying to communicate to the people, you are not going to come with so many musicians blowing, blaring loudspeakers that people can hardly hear what you are saying. Even you see many of the candidates, they cannot even hear themselves talk. They talk of wrong dates, wrong name. They don't even know the name of their own political party because they are so high up, exhausted, in all the noise making they are making. We go around and try to pass this message. So at the end, it's an experiment. At the end, when we see the result, then we'll review it and say, yeah, the guy who went to the grassroots actually won. Or someone will say, oh, the guy who went to the stadium and uh, bought live telecast on television actually won. And why okay. did he win? Every democracy must learn. Every democracy must have variety. Our thinking is that the element in our democracy is in the mind of the voter, that the voter okay. at the end of a campaign season has not been able to understand the issues and that the major political parties, all they want to do is to clock down during the campaign season so that they can make all the noise, abuse each other, um, do all sort of drama, and the election day comes and the voter is not even one inch wiser than he was okay. at the beginning. We're all trying right. to well, break that trend. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Adebayo, speak to, I mean, I mentioned earlier that the, every political party seems to be having their peculiarities, peculiar challenges, you know, and all of that. But I think you, of course, are aware that about sometime last month, uh, the national chairman of your party uh, said that only the National Working Committee uh, members of the party have the authority to determine the direction of the party with regard to elections and related matters and consequently ordered or directed that any member or candidate of the party must take directives from the headquarters of the party before making any comments in the name of the party. Speak to that. What does that mean and what, in what way does that limit or empower you to go about with your campaign? You see, for us, uh, the Social Democratic Party, it's a disciplined party. So you don't want a presidential candidate to say farewell to poverty and insecurity, uh, that we oppose, for example, this new um, haphazard way in which the currency is, is, uh, uh, change has been done, or we, this is our position on foreign policy. And the governorship candidate of your party in three states are saying different things. If you listen to, for example, with due respect, APC, they look like they have uh, schizophrenia. Because the government is in place right now, and then the person who is running as their flag bearer, who stands to the person who is the incumbent, they oppose each other's policy. So they do say the same thing. So you, they, the same party is behaving like an opposition. If you go to the PDP, it is not what Governor River State will say as the policy of the party. It's not what the national chairman will say. It's not what the presidential candidate will say. So you want to make sure that your messaging is disciplined. 
So our national chairman, uh, Elijah Jeho, Musa Gaba, is trying to do what a proper national chairman should do, that we, and we do training. So when you go out, your message will be consistent. So if you go to anybody who is on my campaign, anywhere you find them in the country, they will tell you about fair water poverty and insecurity. They will tell you about chapter two of the constitution. They will tell you about our manifesto. They understand this. Our messaging is consistent. So that's why you will not uh, see us having people rolling on the ground during our rally, uh, doing mimicking and drama. That's why you won't see people talking about religion, ethnicity, and things like that. That's why we don't accuse people of criminality and other things. We just uh, we want to be disciplined. We want our message to be consistent. Because it's uh, like that. Uh, a few days ago, I was in uh, Ad Ad Adamawa, and I, um, Tarab, um, Nasarawa, and I went to see if the former deputy governor uh, of SDP in 1992, who served with uh, Fidel Stabgon. He brought out his policy paper. He was talking exactly the way I'm talking now. So this is the kind of discipline in the messaging that we want. And the policies of uh, Fidel Stabgon in, in uh, Plateau State, which is now Nasarawa and Plateau, it, it, when I started talking about it, everybody said, yes, exactly. This was what you people did uh, 30 years ago. That is what we are trying to bring to the system, that you have to have political party based on ideas. And that if anything happens to me now, and uh, Yusuf Buhari, my deputy, uh, vice president takes over. It's the same policy. We don't have a uh, confusion all over the place. And if you go to any person in our national working committee, they will be talking the same way as a state chairman will talk, talk the same way as a local government executive will talk. That kind of messaging, and it's, it's consistent with what is contained in the Constitution of Nigeria in Chapter 2, that politics should be about issues. And uh, many of them uh, were reminding me, uh, our former governors and the senators, that when they won their election in 1992, they were taken to Center for Democratic Studies oh. to go and learn how to manage the government, uh, promote issues. At the end of the day, in fact, in one of our delegations, uh, Senator Ugochuku Oba, who is the director of finance of our campaign, who used to be a directing staff with the Momoru at Center for Democratic Studies, met the former deputy governor, who is now a traditional ruler in Nasarawa State, and both of them remember that Ugochuku Oba was then a professor, a lecturer, teaching the newly elected deputy governor at that time. So it's that kind of consistency that people are not used to, and that is the discipline we must bring to our politics for it to have a meaning in governance. All right, let's just cross over to the courts uh, for a moment, because we've got some uh, developing stories uh, making the rounds at the moment from the Supreme Court. Remember the matter about the ongoing Naira challenge, uh, some governors, some states had gone to court to challenge some of those decisions. And right now, that is what is playing out in court today. So the Supreme Court of Nigeria, at the moment, is failed to its capacity with the retinue of senior advocates of Nigeria, other lawyers and governors of Kaduna, Kogi states, are there for the hearing of the substantive suit on the Naira swap policy. Now, at the last hearing, the court had temporarily banned the implementation of the February 10 deadline of the CBN from making the 200 Naira, 500 Naira, and the 1,000 Naira notes being a legal tender. At the moment, as we highlighted, Zamfara Kogi and Kaduna State did institute the suit against the CBN. Now, uh, other states, that's Niger, Kano, Ondo, Ikiti, they've all applied to join the suit at the, against the CBN and the federal government. You can see the governors of uh, Kogi and Kaduna physically present there to uh, at least give some impetus to the importance of this matter, which is what is playing out right now at the Supreme Court. So we will bring you more details on that story as we get them. So let's come back to the studio. I want to ask you, I mean, you say you have been going around all, in fact, that you had done a tour of all 774 local governments even before now, <clears throat> excuse me, and you're still continuing it again and you're spending as much as four days in some communities even before you leave those communities. I'm wondering, uh, given where we currently are, uh, especially with the currency crisis, I, I don't know whether to label it as such, um, how have you found, uh, you know, its implementation within local communities that you have visited? Yeah, they think the government has gone bonkers, with due respect. They don't understand. 
For example, I was in Doma, and I met with the Andoma. Doma is a, is, is a very old community that has been in existence since 1232 AD. It's a very old community, and they are world number one in Benin City. And they, 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 they farm, they, they need money to farm, they have a lot of their money on the farm. Now, the, when they heard that the government wanted them to bring money, to exchange for new money, they took their entire money. Some were carrying loads of money because they, used, they would keep their money in the farm, not ordinarily. Then they took their money and they, they went all the way to Lafayette to put their money in the bank because there's no bank. Uh, they used to have three banks, the banks for efficiency purposes, closed the, uh, their branches in Doma, and then they took their money to the bank in uh, Lafia and other places. They have not got their money back, and they can't function. They cannot do anything. And these people are not involved in any political party. They're just farmers. And the farming season is coming soon. It will start raining. They don't know how to buy implements. They don't know how to do anything. And when we were talking to them, they were so, they were almost hugging us when they discovered that we're not part of those people who have brought this uh, unfortunate uh, exercise upon them. So I uh, go around the country, you will see people saying they cannot buy food, they cannot uh, work, they don't even know what the new Nara looks like. So they don't know, and they don't know what a POS looks like. And I use my phone myself on, on this community. I cannot make telephone calls, not talk of checking anything. So this is not even something to debate at all. And it shows the confusion that I mentioned about in terms of people being public places and not on the purpose. If you look at the litigants in the court, they are all APC. The governors are senior members. They are members of the National Executive Committee of the APC. So they are close enough. And immediately after leaving this court, they will pick up the defendant, President Buhari, and they will go to the stadium and continue dancing again. So this is the problem of the leadership that is not worthy of being so called. Mm -hmm. And the, the central bank itself has failed in a simple exercise of being a bank. If you look at the problems that we are dealing with now, the central bank has become part of the bad politics that we are playing. And that is where the Nigerian people need to step back and realize that the central bank is an institution that is not a political party, and it's a professional body. It's supposed to be a professional bankers and economists. Mm -hmm. So we need to go back to that. But I can tell you categorically, people don't like the policy. They don't see how it links with election. They only see that the government is just being callous to them. Uh, okay, That's so, the I mean, the people might not see it, but you, do you see it? No, I see confusion on their part. You see, there's, we have doing You don't see how it links to election? No, it, I think it's just, you see, there is a problem. Is, the problem I see there is that with Nigerian politicians, especially APC, PDP, they believe in state capture. So when they are doing politics, they will use the police, they will use the courts, they will use uh, political parties, they will use the press. Now they think, okay, I can use the central bank too. So that is the problem that they have. They, they use anything to gain advantage. In the end, it's not going to have any effect on whether people can buy votes or not. In the end, it's going to lead to hardship. In the end, it's going to lead to an excuse for INEC to say, well, we couldn't do our logistics, we couldn't get this done. That's what I see. But well, Sabian says that they will provide cash to INEC if, if they need it. But I want to know how it's affecting your own campaign because the fact that you have to go around. Yeah. Uh, and we saw one of the political parties yesterday, Accord, uh, you know, saying that this is going to affect their own, um, you know, deployment for elections on, on that day. They have to pay their uh, members of staff who will work for them on that day, etc. cetera. Uh, do you uh, share such fears? Is that affecting you in any no, way? No, it, it's not affecting us as much as affecting the people. It creates some inconvenience, but if you want to buy fuel, you have to see that they are POS and things like that. Uh, second, but we, our politics was not based on money. It's based on volunteerism. So our agents are not waiting to be paid, for yeah, example. Yeah, but you still have to give them, you still have to spend some money. And maybe for food, for no, it is no more fuel, etc. For, for example, for this policy to affect you on election day, it's already affecting people to feed right now. So it, the election day effect is not as serious as people being in hospital. They want to go to pharmacy to buy medicine and they can't buy. So I don't think the election day effect of it is different from the normal daily effect it has already. There are students who are in school and stuck there because the money that their parents gave to them is the old currency. 
and now they don't have the new currency and they go to an ATM far from their school, like travel 10, 15 kilometers, and they get to the ATM and they are number 250 on the queue. And they have to wait like six hours before they can really get uh, 5,000. By the time it gets to their turn, the money is no longer there. So what I'm saying is that why will we talk about election day? That's the first election day. Like when I go through communities, I just ask them, how do you survive in this community? I want to buy fuel, for example. They will tell us, okay, go to that place. They take old money. Uh, today, I was, as I was in your studio, the governorship candidate of my of our party said, well, we are limiting the community we want to go uh, by elevating about five because in those other communities, they don't have um, POS there. So we want to go to the place that has POS first. It affects us, but the effect it has on us is not as serious as the effect it has on people on daily basis. Right. So it's from that angle that we are asking the central bank to be responsible, to abandon the instruction given to it by politicians. Completely abandon this policy? It's not a policy. Otherwise, you will have seen the policy paper. I, 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 earlier, when you were discussing about it, you were looking yeah. for Bofia, you were looking for CBN the CBN Act. <laughs> it shows to you that there's no policy paper <laughs> that you are looking at. This government central bank is writing letters like uh, somebody who's doing pen pal. You know, in, in a policy, in a, an exercise as serious as this. So normally it's not an exercise. There's no blueprint. There's no white paper on it. So it's what, just what something they, they came out with. You see, every day they are yeah. trying to make the government to be part of their political party. And whatever they, they, anything can be used. The EFCC will be used, DSS will be used, and the CBN is being used. So next time, it, it may be road safety that they're going to use. And that is why Nigerians have to understand that you need to vote people in who understand that governance is about service. And that institutions are set up for purposes. The central bank is set up to stabilize the economy, to make means of exchange easier. There's one ridiculous uh, uh, visual that I see and I shake my head, where the central bank is trying to make its money not portable. So you come with a bag of coins, a heavy, heavy bag of coins that you have to be, be very strong to be able to carry, and all of it amounts to 2,000 naira. So you, you see this kind of thing that over the years, uh, money uh, research has been done to make money portable, but they are going opposite. So what we are trying to let Nigeria know is that don't despair. This government is coming to an end. A more responsible government will come. And if you have old notes, we will help you redeem the old notes because by law, it is a debt that the government owes to you. And like any other debtor, the government cannot... How will you help them redeem the old notes? Because by law, it is so, it must be so. Because uh -huh. you issue the tender, yeah. and it is written on it that any time you present it, it will be honored. Now, to present it, Central Bank has at most one branch in every state. So if I am in a, a movie, uh -huh. uh, and there is a Central Bank branch in, um, in uh, New York, Am I supposed to travel six kilometers on bad road because I want to come and exchange uh, 20,000 at the central bank? No, that policy is wrong. The central bank should have made every bank and every POS operator their agent that you can redeem on our behalf on the date. So what we are trying to do is to make sure that that institution, the Central Bank of Nigeria, which has a very sound history of changing currency notes. Remember, we changed in 1969 uh, during the Civil War. We changed in 1973 uh, from pound to naira. We changed in 1984, which was a calamity. We changed under Soludo and Obasanjo. We didn't feel it. Mm. Right now, the British don't have a queen anymore. They have a king. So the queen heads are not constitutionally valid. So they need to have a king here. But they give themselves two years to go from queen head to king head. And for many years as a private lawyer, I've been a lawyer to currency producers all over the world. I've been you know, at least seven, seven currency change, about 17 currency enhancement exercise, myself personally, including for the Central Bank of Nigeria. It has never been this chaotic. There's a program for it. You do the research. First, the most important thing is to see that the currency has security features. It's an improvement over the past. This one is not an improvement over the one they are changing from, just a crayon over the old color. Second, you want to make sure that the money is well known to every person who wants to use it, both domestically and internationally. So you need to be well known. Three, you want it to be available so that there's no trauma in the exchange between the old one and the new one. And if you want to migrate from the having 
a lot of money in circulation to not having in circulation. Uh -huh. you, you, what you do is do a paradigm shift. You don't make life difficult. You, you realize that you, for example, say every Nigerian who wants a POS, come to a, your bank, we'll give you POS. You, make, you say, okay, six months, there will be no COT if you, do PO, uh, if you are using the POS. You make it, it certifies people. But if you go to England, which is the most senior place where currency comes from, if you go to any coffee shop, you can use the note to buy coffee, even though they've changed to payment system. If you go to Washington, D.C., New York, anywhere, if you take the, the dollar, you can use it. If you take dollar of 20 years ago to the Federal Reserve Bank, they will collect it if it's genuine. Because they want their instrument to be gilt edge. They want to say that in dealing with the government, you take no risks. Any instrument that is issued by us, in fact, if you take a coin used by George Washington in the olden days of George Washington, 1776, to Federal Reserve Bank, they will buy it from you, even at a higher price. So nobody condemns their own currency. So the people there now, the Governor of Central Bank is not an economist, just understand economist. Second, the Board of Governors are not behaving like people who want to protect the bank against the government and against any other person who wants to ruin the currency. All right. And then the politicians are not showing leadership. These people who have gone to the Supreme Court now, they are going to force the Supreme Court to also make mistakes. Force? Yeah, because when you come, well, for example... The lawyers who are going to present no, no, their no, cases see, on both ends. There are certain, there are policy items. The Supreme Court is meant for interpretation of the law. Yeah. It is not to help you to turn a bad policy to a good policy. Their own is to interpret the law. And where, for example, National Economic Council is supposed to meet, yeah. and all the governors will come together, and then they will discuss the issue. It's not supposed to be an issue that is supposed to be taken for litigation because right. what is we... at stake is not the interpretation of the law, but the stupidity of government lack of policy. And that is done at political level. All right, we need to wind down at this point in time. We do thank you very much indeed for your time here today. Mr. Adewale Adebayo is the presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party. And your campaign train moves today to, yes. you said it's uh, going Taraba to be in Taraba. Taraba, Taraba, yes. Interesting there, as their neighbors. Those, yes. They used to be one state, so mm -hmm. very Angola. interesting one. Yes, yes indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All the best to you. Thank you very much, and God bless Nigeria. All right, we will be back in just a moment. Stay with us. to the 2023 verdict. Uh, it's a photo dedication segment now. So uh, we'll talk about uh, the, the polling units, over voting, and some of the matters that you really have to take cognizance of as you get yourself ready to go and perform your civic responsibility to vote. And as you've seen there, Samson Otodo joins us next. He is the executive director for Yaga. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Very good morning to you. And great studio you have here, I must say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, speaking about um, this big election day that we're all counting down to, uh, the polling units, of course, it is very crucial. Overvoting could also arise from those areas which vigilance is of essence. So we'll go through some of those concerns here now. But the letter clearly talks about uh, conduct at polling units, where if you just go ahead and take a look at Section 58 right away, uh, one says, the presiding officer shall regulate the admission of voters to the polling unit and shall exclude all persons other than the candidates, polling agents, poll clerks, and persons lawfully entitled to be admitted, including accredited observers, and the presiding officer shall keep order and comply with the requirement of this act at the polling unit. Two, the presiding officer may order a person to be removed from a polling unit who behaves in a disorderly manner or fall, fails to obey a lawful order. These are some of the provisions we take for granted sometimes when you get to the polling unit where they tell you, please calm down, 
please move this way. Then you raise your voice and think it's business as usual. I told people were, you know, bus stops, but now you've seen, they could ask you to step aside. But something this is usually very dicey because I mean, when you have such a huge crowd, polling officers are usually very cautious how to actually operationalize this clause. Yeah, um, they have sometimes an issue with uh, managing elections and at the polling unit because election is is a human activity. It involves managing human beings. And sometimes these this persons who show up at the polling unit come there with different mindset and orientation. Some of them are probably emotional and sentimental about voting. Some of them are mm -hmm. angry. Some of them are impatient. But they are very cooperative voters. But there's a reason why the law gives the presiding officer the power, you know, to determine who makes it into the polling unit. Because not everyone is expected within the presence of the polling unit. And it is clearly stated those who are and should be at the polling units, like um, voters, because the election is about the voters, so they have to be at the polling unit. Um, there are also election officials, there are election observers and duly accredited um, persons. So yes, the presiding officer does have the power. But what then is a, is a polling unit? Because it's, it's important that we unpack it. And a polling unit is simply you know, the location where, as a voter, you are required to show up to either register to vote or vote. But in this particular case, it is the location where you cast your vote. Mm -hmm. And every voter is assigned to a particular polling unit. And INEC has described, and the law clearly says, what locations can be used as polling units. And they must be public buildings. So things like religious centers, traditional centers, cannot be used as polling units. They are not public enough. No, they are not, they are not public. Um, because elections are a civil uh, yeah. activity and um, endeavor. Um, so there's the, the principles of neutrality are critical when it comes to elections. Because uh, you don't want elections ascribed to a particular religion or uh -huh. to a particular um, tried because in, in its case, we're a secular state. And as a secular yeah. state, it is important that public institutions are used as, as locations for polling units. So those are the polling units. And then, I said there are 176,846 polling units. Now, this figure wasn't the figure um, that was used in the 2019 elections. And there were about 119,000 polling units in 2019. But additional polling units were created um, by INEC. And there's a reason why these additional polling units were created. First, there are polling units, um, one that were congested. So you go to polling stations or polling units on election day, you discover that there are over 10,000 people who are registered to vote in a particular polling unit. And the total number of hours that we um, that Nigeria has or has allotted or assigned for voting yeah. is from 8:30 to 2:30 p.m. 8:30 to 2:30 p.m. is somewhere it's about six uh, six or five hours there thereabout, and it's insufficient to have 10,000 people, you know, vote within that um, amount of of time, and so. INEC decongested the polling unit because it wanted to expand access for citizens to access those polling units. There were also cases where polling units were quite located at, you know, locations that are distant from the residence of people. So that was also another reason why INEC created, you know, um, additional polling units. But also, you know, before the 20, um, after the 2019 elections, there were, um, voting points that were created um, by INEC. There were also voting point settlements. All of these settlements and voting points, there were sub-voting points under polling units. And when it comes to the collation and tabulation of results, there was often confusion. And now those voting point settlements and voting points have now been converted into polling units. That's why you have this number of um, of, of polling units, and we expect that it would increase, you know, the turnout of voters um, for for elections. But INEC, you know, migrated people 
from polling units to polling units. And this is the whole essence of, 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 of today's conversation. Yeah. Because there is need to go and locate and confirm your polling unit before election day. Because some people have been moved from one polling unit to another. And the rationale behind the movement is to make the voting process seamless for you so you can easily access the polling unit. Because the threshold for each polling unit is 750 per polling unit. And so places where you have more than that number, they have moved and migrated people to polling units that are within the same location. So we expect that it wouldn't be um, distant. But there are three reasons why it's important that every voter out there should confirm and locate their polling unit on election day. The first reason is you need to identify the polling unit where your name is on the register of that polling unit to vote. So that means they should have checked their name on the register first. Yes. So INEC has said they would publish, you know, the voters register for um, all the 176,846 polling units. That's what INEC has said. But before the publication, voters should go and locate and confirm their polling unit. Because if you show up at a wrong polling unit on election day, your name will not be on the voters register. Your name will not be on the beavers for that particular polling unit. This is why it is important that voters should locate and confirm their polling unit. So what if a voter goes to a polling unit that his name is not, and his name happens to be on another polling unit? So does it mean that he has to show up at the right one? Because if you show up at the wrong one, will there be how easy or difficult will it be for you to move to another one? Because chances are you may not even know where that one would be, would it? Well, if you look at the information that has come from INEC, what they have said, is the migration is within the same location. So, for instance, where you had voting points, and what was a voting point? So if you come to, let's say this is polling unit X, yeah. and, there are, and there's a polling unit X here with 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 voters. In 2019, they will create sub or what you call baby polling units. Same access. Same, within the same location, okay. but it would just be a separate voting point. So sometimes when you approach polling, a polling unit, you discover there are three or four um, voting, voting points. Yeah. Now what you know, INEC has done is those voting points have now been converted to polling units. So if you are moved, it, it will be within the, same, within the same location. And that's the general principle, and that's what we expect. So if you show up in, say, polling unit X, uh -huh. and your name is not on the register, the probability that your name is on the register for the polling unit closest to that polling unit is quite high. And, and this is the, the reason why voters need to go and confirm their polling unit to avoid confusion and chaos on election day. Because you would see situations where a voter will show up, they will stand on the queue, and then they probably wait for 30 to one hour, only and then when they approach, only to find out they're not supposed not to be there. So wow. this is important to avoid confusion on election day. Mm -hmm. The third reason why this is important is to vote early. If you verify or confirm your polling unit before election day, you show up early, the chances that you would vote early um, will be high. So this is why it is important for voters to verify and locate their polling units before election day. And we can talk about what are the ways you yeah. can verify or locate your polling unit before election day. Well, we'll talk about that in a bit, but you know, there was some confusion when INEC itself, you know, announced that a number of polling units, I think over 200 of them, there will be no election or there will be no voting at those polling units on election day. Um, and there was some question, the people did not quite understand how come it was that, you know, no elections are going to take place in those polling units. Can you help shed some light on it? So, Again, this is where INEC needs to provide for the explanation. And I think that the statement attributed to the chairman when the parties met was quite um, provided some information, but more information needs to be provided. So 
when the decongestion, when po new polling units were created, it resulted to three different types of polling units. The first one was you had oversized polling units. So oversized mean polling units that had over 750, yeah. right? You now had um, polling units that had only one registered voter because these polling units were located in, in, in several communities. And want to believe, based on what I next said, that communities were consulted in this, but there were also relocation of polling units from the homes of politicians, from even shrines, as well as traditional institutions. But then you now had zero polling units. And, and I think what, what INEC is saying is these zero polling units um, were created because, you know, voters, or we have this zero polling unit because voters didn't choose, you those, know, those okay. polling units. This is why, you know, you have situations where um, those polling units do not have registered voters because during voter registration, voters uh, asked the question, where is your address, where is your location? And then the registration official will look for the polling units around that area and then assign you to those polling units. So what INEC is saying is that for these polling units, nobody selected those polling units. That's why you have um, zero polling units. And there are 200 and 240 of, of them, yeah. which I also think that, yes, is a level of transparency to publish those those 240 um, polling units, but polit political parties, observers, and media should use that as a guide to ensure that no result comes out of you know those those polling, those polling units. units on election day. That's going to be very very <clears throat> very key. So now um, you're talking about how voters could identify uh, their yes. polling units. So mm -hmm. let, let's talk about that. So so there are two ways um, you can locate and verify your polling units. The first one is what INEC provided, which is the, the website. Mm -hmm. um, you can do that on INEC's website. And the portal, I think, is displayed on your screen, is voters.inecnigeria.org, as well as the cvr.inecnigeria.org slash VVS. So, Did you try to locate yours? Yes, so, so I use that oh. as, as an example. So <laughs> okay. when you go to that portal, you need to impute the following information. First, your state of registration. So where is the state where you registered? So in my case, I registered in the FCT. It will ask you of your local government of registration, and mine is the municipal, it's AMAC, then your last name, your first name, and your date of birth. You must have this information, because if you impute a wrong information, then your f details will not be found. So that's the column where you need to impute those information. When you impute that, it will pop up with your information. And so I am on the voters register, and that's my um, details. So you see, yes, um, the name and then the polling unit. So that polling unit that I have is a new polling unit because I did transfer you know, my voter records from, a, from where I used to live to a, to a new place. Oh. But what is interesting about this particular portal yeah. is the polling units, some polling units have been geotagged. So you can locate the polling unit from the map. And the green spot you, you find there, mm -hmm. once you click that, it takes you to the map where you can locate your polling units using, um, using Google Map. So this is the first you know, way to locate your, your polling, polling units on the INEX portal, which is voters.inecnigeria.org. So in all of this, uh, because one of the <clears throat> excuse me, issues that also came up uh, with the polling units happen to be over voting. Now, there's a lot of confusion about that. People wondered, look, they never thought that that could happen this time around. But yes, there's a flip side to it. So tell us, how do people, how do we spot, avoid, or ensure that this doesn't happen? Yeah, but before we also get to that, there's a second um, way you can confirm your polling unit, and actually okay. third. The, the second one is to look out for when INEC will publish the list you know, of um, um, registered voters in your polling unit. Mm -hmm. But you can also use WhatsApp um, to, to check um, and locate your polling unit. And there's a WhatsApp chatbot um, that exists where you find the information 
all you need to do is to send, you know, just hello, just chat with the WhatsApp chat bot. Um, and that's the number um, displayed on the screen. Um, and it's 0906-2830860. Once you chat with this chat bot, it mm -hmm. gives you inf um, information um, as well as a menu. Once you go to locate uh, your polling unit, it takes you, you know, to the location where you can locate your, your polling unit. So beyond going to the website, you can also use the WhatsApp chat bot that has been provided, you know, by Yaga Africa um, to get all the information. And it's not just um, the polling units. Um, you can also get election results on election day and all the information that you require will be on the WhatsApp chat bot and just to make it seamless for people. INEC is said there will be a phone, um, there will be a number where people can text um, their voter identification number and then and it pops up with their details. So we are expecting nice. um, additional information. Very but nice. to trans to pivot into over voting, yeah. um, I think it's important and I'm glad that we're talking about it this morning. What is over voting? And we've you've repeatedly even on this program explained what over voting is. Over voting occurs when the total number of total number of votes cast in a polling unit is higher than the total number of accredited voters. It means that overvoting has occurred in those polling units. Now, what are the reasons for overvoting? There are two main reasons for overvoting. One is human errors from the um, either presiding officers and the polling officials in the course of recording the results. Often you find those errors. So sometimes when somebody tries to, uh, sometimes when you write um, five, it could mean eight. It sometimes it could look like three. It's the same way when you say two, um, just just those uh, human errors. Are one, two, it's deliberate manipulation of the process. So sometimes compromised polling officials can alter those figures, and it can lead to overvoting. What are the implications of overvoting? It's cancellation of votes. Once there is overvoting a polling unit, the election for that polling unit will be cancelled. Wow. And the consequence is it could lead to inconclusive election. And so there are five ways, you know, voters who are preparing to vote next week and in the governorship election can prevent overvoting. The first one is anyone who shows up at the polling unit next week. Uh -huh should present themselves to be accredited using the beavers. Do not allow anyone tell you to vote without accreditation. <laughs> it is important that you insist to be accredited using the beavers. Sometimes you will see communities, you will see party agents and compromised polling officials issue ballot papers without accreditation. As a voter, refuse to do what? To vote without accreditation. So that's the first one. The second um, one is in the course before the accreditation starts, please ensure that the beavers has zero records. So they must look at it. They must look at it. There are party agents there, but the presiding officers are required, you know, to show that Everybody. there are zero records for accreditation figures. The third one is as a voter on the 25th of February for presidential and national assembly elections, you are entitled to only three ballot papers. Do not let anyone issue you more than three ballot papers. The first one is for presidential, the second one is for Senate, and the third one is for um, uh, oh. House of Reps. Oh. And then for the second election in 28 states, voters are entitled to two ballot papers. So do not receive additional ballot papers uh, more than the ones that you are entitled to. And the fourth one... Uh-oh. We really have to go now. <laughs> okay. We really have so, to go. We know here, that day. Here's what we'll do. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you've got questions, send them in. Yeah. So we will collate all of your questions, and then there will be a lot more of the sessions that we'll, we'll bring to you as we progress. So it's not by any chance over. We're just getting started. So I have a lot more of this, so don't worry.
you haven't lost much. You haven't even lost anything because we will do this over and over again. Mm -hmm. But that is how far we can go today on the 2023 verdict. Thank you very much indeed, Samson. Thanks, the, always a delight. Executive yeah, Director for Yaga. That is the show today from here. We will be back tomorrow. Until then, have a very lovely day. I'm Chamberlain Oso. Well, just to acknowledge your mails, because we see them coming in. Hopefully, we'll be able to take some of them later. Dr. Peter Awodi, Undubisi Samuel, Enofe, and a number of other tweets. I know that we will take most of them, perhaps tomorrow. Thank you so much. I'm Mao Kweogun Yusuf. I'm from Lagos. Thank you for watching. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. And I hope you've taken some lessons, especially about locating your polling units. You can rewatch this on your own. I'm Aya Makine. Have a wonderful rest of your day.